societies and our environment. We can look away or we can recognize the ailments that threaten a long-term future and build a more sustainable and inclusive world. The agenda for the New Economy Forum is global. It's to challenge government and business leaders to work together in five key areas. Finance, trade, climate, public health and cities. This is urgent. Economies are failing. Societies are breaking apart. Our planet is burning. Firefighters in Southern California struggle to contain a massive disaster. We embrace technology as part of our solutions. New economy must be digital. We firmly believe that no problem in the world today can be solved without East-West collaboration. Our perspective is bottom-up. We are all in this together. This is the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Please welcome Justin B. Smith, Chief Executive Officer of Bloomberg Media and Executive Chair of Bloomberg New Economy. The Bloomberg New Economy Forum was born of the conviction that East-West dialogue must be part of any solution to global problems. That has never been more true than it is today as COVID-19 ravages the global economy. The health of our planet depends on leaders from the public and private sectors, from East and West, collaborating to defeat this pandemic. If the world can't come together to fight COVID-19, how will we ever find the will to collaborate on other threats to public safety? Natural disasters, financial crises, and above all, climate change. None of these problems can be resolved by any single country. They are common threats. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. We launched the New Economy Forum two years ago in Singapore. Then we took it to Beijing last year. This year, we're in cyberspace, which is entirely appropriate. Today, we're engaging in a borderless conversation about a health catastrophe that crosses all national boundaries. The virus is a product of this era of globalization, hopping from continent to continent aboard aircraft, and it requires a globalized response. This will not be the last pandemic to menace humanity. In a few minutes, we'll be hearing from several of the world's leading virus hunters who are tracking the thousands of pathogens that may one day jump from animals to humans. But I hope it will be the last time we face a pandemic so unprepared. It is simply unacceptable that the world invests so little in public health infrastructure, in stockpiles of emergency medical equipment, and in research into life-saving vaccines and therapies. Addressing this issue is a moral imperative, and it is also good economics. McKinsey research shows that every dollar invested in public health produces two to four dollars in economic benefits. If our conversations today help build bridges between global leaders so essential to pandemic preparedness 
as well as the broader fight against infectious diseases, it will have proved the value of our new economy institution and the vision of our founder, Michael Bloomberg. A landmark date in the history of modern public health is 1854, when the British physician, John Snow, demonstrated that cholera is spread by contaminated water. He traced an outbreak of the disease in London's Soho district to a communal water pump on Broad Street. By removing the handle on the water pump, health officials halted the local outbreak in its tracks. That victory helped give rise to an urban sanitation movement that saved millions upon millions of lives. Unfortunately, there are no easy answers to the airborne pathogens that threaten us today. Our modern service-based economies are reliant on face-to-face -face contact, but we can and must eliminate the obstacles to global health collaboration. The lives and livelihoods of billions of people depend on it. That's the goal of our work today. To our Bloomberg New Economy community, thank you for being with us virtually this year. I want to leave you on a final positive note. While the future remains uncertain, we expect to hold the fourth annual Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Beijing. Mark your diaries. We will see you there. In the meantime, please stay safe and well and enjoy the final day of the 2020 Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Greetings and welcome. I'm Carol Masser, your host for the final day of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Today's session is focused on global health. Humanity depends on it. None of us are safe unless everyone is safe. Yet almost everywhere, public health is chronically underfunded. Now, to begin the day, we bring you the next in our series of Global Voices. We asked frontline workers and healthcare systems around the world to tell us about the challenges they face during this pandemic. Take a listen now to the experience of a nurse we met in Johannesburg. My worst experience with COVID was not getting it myself and being scared that I'm going to leave my family in trouble. I think it was more that I was going to infect my 75-year-old mom that was a cardiac and a diabetic, or that other, other family members were going to get sick and die because of me. Losing three of my family members within three weeks of each other was hard. We couldn't mourn together. In regards to what the general public behaved like, I'm hoping and praying that the second wave that comes along does not destroy any other family like the way COVID destroyed my family. The sad part for us was we believe in the touch policy in our department. We hug our patients, we love our patients. They didn't have that personal touch where we would hug them and say, it's fine, we are with you. The other thing that, that really worries me, if first world countries are having a problem with the economies, what is going to happen to third world countries? As it is, we are hit with all other types of illnesses like HIV, TB. For COVID to come and destroy our setup is even worse because we've had many patients that did not even come back for the regular medication because they were worried about COVID and now have resistance. For my colleagues and for all other frontline workers, I say thank you so much for being there because my family members really appreciated your care. Thank you very much.
and some heartfelt comments there. Well, next up, we have a spotlight on virus hunters. They are the scientists who are trying to head off the next pandemic. Bloomberg New Economy Forum editorial director Andy Brown sat down with speakers Peter Dasek. He's president of the EcoHealth Alliance. Professor Wang Lifa, Duke and U.S. Medical School professor at the Program in Emerging Infectious Diseases. And Anne Ramoyne, professor of epidemiology at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Andy. COVID-19 has claimed over one million lives and brought the global economy to its knees. How were we so unprepared for this catastrophe? Scientists who study zoonotic viruses, pathogens that jump from animals to humans, have been sounding the alarm for years about the risk of infection from bats. Obviously, we didn't take their warnings seriously enough. So what can we do to predict and prevent the next pandemic? I'm Andy Brown, the editorial director of the Bloomberg New Economy. Joining me today are three leading scientists who've spent their careers hunting viruses. Dr. Peter Dasak is the president of EcoHealth Alliance, a US-based organization that conducts research and outreach programs on global health, conservation, and international development. Dr. Anne Ramoyne is a professor of epidemiology at the UCLA School of Public Health. Dr. Wang Lianfa is the director of the program in emerging infectious diseases at Duke NUS Medical School, Singapore. Welcome. You're among the world's leading virus hunters. It's no exaggeration to say that you stand between humanity and the next pandemic. My first question, could we have prevented this one? Peter, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, of course we could. Look, we, we knew um, where the next emerging disease was going to come from. We've, we've known that for 10 years or more. We know where these hotspots are. We know the sorts of behaviours that lead to pandemics, you know, um, cutting down forests, building roads into remote areas, coming into contact with wildlife, hunting them, eating them, trading them in an unprecedented way around the world. And, and we've known about this. We, we even had the programs in place in a very small way um, to begin to understand how we can stop those behaviors, how we can work with local communities, understand what the incentives are and help them do things in a safer way to protect their health that then protects our health. The problem is we weren't doing this on a big enough scale. We didn't take it seriously enough, despite the warnings, despite the red flags. And do you think we'll ever get to the bottom of where COVID-19 came from? What's the most likely theory? Well, right now, the, there is some evidence. There's pretty strong evidence that bats carry hundreds of related viruses, including the closest known relatives to SARS-CoV-2, that bats, particularly in South China and in the bordering countries, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, um, that's where these viruses tend to evolve. And that's where people come into contact with them regularly. We, we estimate over a million people a year are exposed to bat origin coronaviruses in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, normally they don't do much, probably a little bit sick. This time, somehow the virus got into the, the big cities of, of central China, Wuhan, in the wildlife markets, exploded and spread around the world. Lin Fa, there are hundreds of thousands of viruses circulating in bats. How does COVID-19 rank in terms of deadliness? Well, in terms of deadliness, you know, for the virus which already know jump from bats to humans, COVID-19 is not the most deadly, right? We have Ebola, we have Hanger and the Nipper. In you know, the Nipper virus, you know, uh, on average has a case fatality of 50 to 70 and in certain outbreaks, 100%. Whereas the COVID-19, we're talking about, you know, maybe one to 3% at most. So certainly it's not the most deadly, but looks like it's very transmissible. Yeah, so that's two different sort of uh, uh, scales, right? In terms of fatality, it's not on top. Okay, time for a prediction. Anne, when will the next pandemic strike and where is it most likely to come from? Well, we don't know exactly where the next pandemic will strike. It could strike anywhere, but we do know where the hotspots in the world are. We've all been doing research on emerging infectious diseases in this group 
for the last several decades. We know that wet markets are, are important places. We know that places where hunting, in particular commercial hunting is happening, um, is are important. We know that places in Asia, places in Africa, where people really live at the animal-human interface are important places where viruses are easily able to jump species and then spread. The bottom line is, is that viruses don't need passports, they don't need visas, they can move easily without any detection, so we always have to be ready. And the problem is, is that we haven't had the kind of early warning system and investment in this kind of early warning system that we've needed uh, from the very beginning. We've been able to spend a lot of money uh, preventing uh, wars and to be able to, to invest in systems to, to, to help us uh, protect against invasion from our perceived enemies. But what we don't think about is invasion from viruses. And I think that now we're all starting to think about this um, on, a, on a global scale, because all of us who've been working on viruses have been thinking about this for a very long time, that we really need to be able to invest in protecting ourselves from viruses. This is the next frontier. As Bill Gates said, it's microbes, not missiles. Let me stay with you for the next question, Anne. Every time a pandemic comes along, people start shouting, this is a wake up call. But nobody ever wakes up. We've had SARS and MERS and Ebola. HIV has killed more than 30 million people around the world, yet we always seem to be unprepared. Every time it comes as a surprise. Why should the COVID-19 be any different? Well, I think it's, a, it's an issue of, of remembering it's much easier, as my, as my father-in-law used to say, it's much easier to stay out of trouble than it is to get out of trouble. And we are definitely in trouble right now. Um, and we're paying the price. If we had invested in these systems early on, we would not be paying the kind of price we're paying right now. I think it, it may have been Peter, I don't remember where I, who, who I can attribute this to, but there have been many um, studies that have shown that the cost of dealing with a pandemic can be 500 times greater than preventing a pandemic. And that's where we need to be, be focusing on right now. It's never too late to, to get started. The earlier we start, the more prevention we'll have. But what we do know as humans continue to encroach upon uh, in, into, into forests um, and into places where they're in greater contact with species, that the, that the need for consumption of animals increases, we are going to be seeing more and more of this. Uh, and, and we have precedents. Um, those who are, I, there, the, we also know that people have said before, there's a famous um, philosopher who said, those who forget the past are destined to repeat it. And so we really need to be able to learn from our lessons now to be able to prevent what could be happening in the future. Linfa, how can you possibly track down all of the viruses that circulate in bats? Second, how do you know which ones will be deadly for humans? And third, which ones should we prepare vaccines and therapeutics for? Yeah, so that's a, a very tough question, right? To start with, how do we know how many there? You know, Peter and I have been working with a lot of scientists in the world. And then secondly, to predict which one is ready to jump is uh, even more difficult. I think, you know, with the scientific tools we have, if we have enough money, Peter and I strongly believe we can catalog most of the virus, good to 90%, 99% of the virus in mammals, if we have the will internationally. Then the second one is to predict which one is ready to jump. I think that that's going to be more difficult, but we have learned enough lessons in the last three decades, right? Coronavirus, you know, three, three really large outbreaks just in two decades. So that's certainly in the top of the list, the filovirus and the paramyxovirus. These are the three top targets. But I think, you know, we can do better without even 100% accuracy in predicting that. We don't need to make a vaccine for every virus in bats to, in order to win the war. I always say that all about is the international collaboration and we get a ready, like Anne is saying, that if we're ready, then even if we can detect the early transmission event to an intermediate host, for example, before they go to human, that's better because we don't have a human. But even if we get to human, just like COVID-19, you know, 
if early December we sense that we detect that, I think we can prevent the COVID-19 outbreak. So there are three different levels we can do much better. And so far, I think we don't have enough funding and we don't have enough the public will to do better. I always say in the science, of course, we can improve. But personally, I have been in the game for 30 years and I have watched the science has progressed so much, but the political will and the collaboration is left behind, I think. That's where I think we need to do better. I mean, can I chime in on this a little bit? I, look, we, we, we have a challenge. We, have, we know there are a bunch of viruses out there that we don't know about. We don't know the, the identity of. So we went to China um, 15 years ago, working with Linfa and others um, at Wuhan Institute of Virology. We caught bats, we looked at them, and we said, how many viruses can we find? We found hundreds of different strains. But we didn't just say, okay, there's lots of viruses out there. We actually sequenced the viral genome and then use that in the lab to recreate the spike proteins of those viruses, the, the proteins they use to bind to human cells. Those spike proteins were then used to test the drug remdesivir to see how broad it is, how broadly effective it is. So there is proof of concept that you can go from finding these new viruses, assessing which ones look dangerous, and then trialing them out in the lab to test new vaccines and drugs. And look, if, if the cost of doing that is high, we estimate about you know over a billion dollars to identify 70% of the unknown viruses. There are about 1.7 million unknown viruses on the planet. And that's a lot of money, but put that against the cost of a, a single pandemic like COVID, trillions of dollars to the global economy, hundreds of thousands of deaths already and more to come. Um, it is worth spending that money. We estimate if you reduce the number of cases by 1%, you get a nine to one return on investment. That's a pretty good odds. And, and I think that there's a willingness now on the planet to do something different. I think we've got to get out there and run that program and show the value in reduced mortality and reduced economic loss. Peter, did we just get unlucky this time? Animal virus cross to humans all the time. Few people die, end of story. What made COVID-19 the real monster that it is? Well, you know, we got unlucky with the great influenza in 1918. We got unlucky again with so-called Spanish flu in the 1950s. We got unlucky again with HIV. We've, we've gotten unlucky more and more often over the last few decades. There's a reason for that look. We're making our own luck because we're continuing to um, expand across the planet. We're, we're pretty, doing pretty unsustainable things in terms of land use change, hunting of wildlife, globalized travel and trade, we're creating the perfect setup for a pandemic. And they're coming quicker. You know, we've tracked emerging disease origins for the last few decades. There are about 500 of them. And we can show that they're happening more frequently. Um, they're, they're spreading quicker. They're killing more people. And they're crushing our economies more substantially. This, this economic hit follows SARS at about 30 to $50 billion. Um, it follows um, swine H1N1 at a few hundred million dollars. The, these outbreaks are expensive. They're unsustainable at this point. So let's do something about the underlying drivers. And what are the lessons from the early failures to snuff out COVID-19 at source in Wuhan? As a group of virus hunters, you knew about this weeks before the rest of the world did, right? Well, the lessons learned are that people don't communicate and that the, there's no system in place. It shouldn't be just a little bit of, of chatter between, uh, between laboratories and between scientists. We need a global system that has great communication. We've talked about before, we've talked about these issues of how people need to be connected better, they need to communicate better. In 9-11, what we learned uh, from 9-11 was that the FBI and the CIA and all of the, the, the global uh, systems that were supposed to protect us and to watch for uh, terrorist um, for, for terrorist activity we're not communicating with each other and we have the same problem right now we have labs all over the world that are very capable of detecting viruses and to be able to do the work underfunded but capable of doing this work and we don't have a system in place where labs are able to communicate and to be able to share information and to be able to move quickly um, this is one of the biggest problems that we've that we've identified and one of the things that we really should learn and heed the lessons right now. If we had better communication, 
we would have been able to mobilize much more quickly. We also don't have that kind of global force to be able to go in and to be able to help a country be able to mitigate spread at the source. This happened in China, where there was a lot of capacity in place. But if this had started someplace else with less capacity, we would have had a much bigger problem and we would know much less about this virus right now. I think another very important lesson that you need, that we should all be learning right now is that research needs to start immediately at the same time as containment, because that's how you're gonna learn how to be able to mitigate, how to be able to stop spread, contain it, and, and, and be able to understand how to be able to move then into the next phase of drugs, therapeutics, vaccines. If government said to you, spend as much as you like on preventing the next pandemic what would you spend it on and where would you concentrate your resources again i come back to say you know science is still evolving but i personally fear you know i work in this field we have enough platforms and enough technique to do early detection and prevention the key is that uh, you know i think Anne is mentioning that, that the lack of the communication I feel like we also need a legal framework. You know, I used to work in Australia, you know, in the animal health field. Uh, Australia is a big country and I work in the national facility down in South. But there is a legal frame to say that if vets see some kind of unusual cluster of disease, if you could not diagnose, you are bound by law within 48 hours, you have to report to the government and to the central lab. Now, if we do that to human health, because, you know, I'm in Singapore now, you know, uh, even in USA, California, you know, we doctors see these unusual cases all the time. Now, I think uh, people can accuse us of being panic and alarm sort of, you know, uh, raising. But for me, I always say when you're dealing with emerging infectious diseases, I prefer to be overreacting rather than underreacting. So if I have all the money, first of all, we'll strengthen research and, uh, you know, improve our detection platform and go to active surveillance rather than passively, once we have a, you know, right now we have a COVID-19, then we ask where it's from, it's too late, right? We don't have a sample collected, you know, beforehand. And then certainly most importantly is really the political will from the national level to the international level is that I feel like, you know, we are at a stage, if you don't investigate unusual cases and small clusters, you will end up like COVID-19. For example, I always say early December or even maybe late no November, if the, the hospital you will hand smell something unusual, if they're bound by certain laws to report and the national international team got involved, I am really confident we could have controlled, you know, without suffering right now. Peter, as humans, we've made ourselves more vulnerable to zoonotic diseases by pushing into the wild. What's more important, do you think, in heading off the next pandemic? Changing human behavior or identifying potentially lethal viruses? Yeah, I think we've got to do two really critical things. You know, I, I go back to that terrorist analogy, the 9-11 analogy. Prior to 9-11, um, terrorist, terrorist um, um, attacks happened and we dealt with them. We cleaned up and we moved on. 9-11 was a transformational change. And, and, and what it said to us was, the impact of a terrorist attack is too much. We need to do something radical. So what did the US government do? They tracked every single phone call coming into the US, a pretty pretty revolutionary piece of surveillance. Why aren't we doing that with pandemics? We, we've now hit a transformative change with COVID-19. We should be listening to the rumors of outbreaks on the ground around the world. Why are we sitting here knowing there are 1.7 million unknown viruses and not bothering to go out and identify them? We don't, we don't do that with terrorists. We go to every single terrorist cell. We listen to what they're saying. When we hear the rumors of an attack, we send in the drones. We need the same mentality for pandemics. And you know, by, by looking at that, we also look at what causes the radicalization of terrorism. And, and a, a similar analogy to pandemics, when we push our, our roads into rainforests and when we industrialize the wildlife trade, we're creating this incredible risk. We know it's a risk. We don't bring the surveillance in at the same time. That's what we need to do. We need to look at our own behavior, our own consumption practices, and at least protect against pandemic risk within them and also reduce them. That's how we're going to get away from what we're in now, which is the pandemic era. Peter and Lin Fa, we're out of time. Let's hope that governments around the world heed your warnings. Thank you for your time. 
And I gotta say, what a great launching pad for our first live panel discussion of the day. It is entitled, Never Again, Rebuilding Global Public Health. Now, a quick house housekeeping note, if you are a new Economy Forum delegate watching live on our platform right now, please remember to submit questions to us by clicking the Ask a Question tab below the video player on your screen, and I will try to make sure to ask them on the air. If you're watching on our live stream, you can send along questions as well to our moderator on Twitter using the hashtag, Our New Economy. So let's get to this panel. Our speakers are Stefan Bonsell, the CEO of Moderna, Regina Dugan, CEO of Welcome Leap, and Dr. Wu Zunyo, Chief Epidemiologist at the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I am very honored to moderate what I think is a very, very upcoming discussion. Um, all of you, first of all, welcome, welcome. I do want to talk about kind of where we are today, because in order for us to look forward, do better going forward, we've kind of got to get a gut check of where we are. Some headlines today. Oxford study confirming AstraCOVID shots uh, response in elderly, and then Moderna, the vaccine production is gearing up according to their partners. So, Stefan, I do want to start with you. This has been a big week for Moderna. Uh, your vaccine, nearly 95 percent efficacy, five days. That news came out on Monday. Five days is a lot in this world, or four days, I guess. That's where we are. Tell me what, what's the update since the news on Monday, and where are we? So good morning and thank you for having us. So indeed on Monday, we announced that the first interim analysis of a phase three study, that's a study of 30,000 participants, showed almost 95% efficacy. Uh, but the piece that makes me almost more excited is the fact that of the 11 people with severe disease, they were all on placebo. We had none on the vaccine. And so if you think about it, what does that mean? I mean that once we get the final data within the next, you know, 7 to 15 days, we should be able to see if this is confirmed that if you get our vaccine, you will have 95% chance of having no disease. And if you get disease, you will have mild symptoms, meaning you will not have severe disease. And as we know, it has really been a big impact in terms of hospitalization, for the patient doing the worst ICU, for patient doing the worst death. And all the impact it has had not only on human life, of course, but on the mental health, on the economy, uh, we think this could be a game changer. And so what we're doing now is getting the, the final data all locked up, submitting this to regulatory agencies around the world, uh, and hopefully, I hope, getting the vaccine approved under emergency use before the end of the year. We're making as much product as we can, and we said we will have before the end of the year 20 million doses ready to ship as soon as we have regulatory approval. All right, so that's certainly some upbeat news. Dr. Wu, I want to bring you into this conversation. When you and I spoke over the weekend, I believe you were in Xinjiang or had been in Xinjiang. China has done, and I think most would argue that as among the biggest, the most developed country, you guys have done a good job in terms of containing the virus. But even so, there continues to be breakouts. Where are we in China when it comes to COVID-19? I just come back from uh, Xinjiang, now back to the Beijing. We uh, just uh, controlled another outbreak uh, in Kashka, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. The epidemic uh, started in the letter of October and uh, brought under control in the November. So in the China, I think what we did is to uh, have very strong uh, surveillance and uh, treat control the epidemic as a war. So. Uh, go back to the earlier response to the initial outbreak in Wuhan. Most of the people suspect China delayed or does not respond very quickly. Actually, I give you two examples. We did a very uh, bold decision. For example, when the outbreak uh, first noticed by doctors, that's uh, last December 27th, and the national experts arrived in the Wuhan, they made a bold decision to close the seafood market. At that time, there were only 40 cases, and uh, 27 of them had exposure to Huanan seafood market. Make that decision is a tough, and the national expert and the local expert has different opinion, and the local uh, expert has gone against uh, to achieve that decision. Another decision is to uh, shut down Wuhan city. Uh, the decision was made in the January 22nd. At that time, we only have about 500 cases. That decision made had uh, determined the scale of the COVID-19 
outbreak mm -hmm. in the whole China. The two, the two decisions made, I think, is the best uh, of the philosophy prepare for the worst scenario. That's on that principle. So we uh, responded to the COVID-19 very quickly. We tried to remove all the right virus from the community to clean it up and make the society safe. So now China, I think, is back to the zero local transmission now. Over. Regina, I want you to come in on this too. What are you hearing from your network about sure. kind of where we are in this process and in this cycle in terms of dealing with the virus? Well, I want to calibrate for a moment because remember the normal time to go from an outbreak to a vaccine is something like five to 10 years. So this achievement here is remarkable, unprecedented. The team at Moderna goes from virus sequence to first dosing in humans in 63 days. And as Stefan is fond of saying, that's an advance a decade in the making. In fact, I remember a decade ago when mRNA-based vaccines were first proposed. And the critics said there was no evidence to suggest it would work. And others said there is no evidence to suggest it won't. We should try. And if we are successful, it would matter. And here we are today. In fact, it matters. So I think what we're hearing now is how do we begin to work on the next pieces? So how do we shorten the clinical trial? How do we begin to get manufacturing underway so that we can couple the early warning with a rapid response? And there's still much more to do there. In, in my view, this is the Sputnik moment of our generation, right? And in the same way that Sputnik inspired a space age, so too might this pandemic inspire a health age lots to do. So I want to continue this conversation because now I want to kind of look forward. A quick poll and a reminder to everybody who's watching the poll that's out there. We'd love to hear your response. The question we're asking, what are the lessons from Asia's successful response to COVID-19? Some individual freedom must be sacrificed for the public good. That's answer A. Answer B, early lockdowns reduce overall economic impact. Answer C, more investment in digital health infrastructure, including contact tracing. And D, face coverings work. So having said that, and we'll look for those responses. So let me ask you, how do we make sure this never, ever happens again? Bloomberg New Economy said there is no greater challenge for our global leaders than figuring out how to make sure this never happens again. Stefan, can we do this? Do we now have the playbook? I think we've learned a lot. And as Regina said, I mean, first, what has been done this year by scientists all around the world and the collaboration we have seen is unprecedented in terms of the speed. But we've learned a lot as well. And I think there are two dimensions where we should invest aggressively across the world in public-private partnership to reduce the time to get to a vaccine. Because as we know, you know, public health measures are extremely important. Uh, and right now, wearing a mask and social distancing are critical. Uh, treatment are very important to take care of people in hospital. But to really get back to normal, we need to vaccinate people. And so I'm going to focus on the vaccine front, which is really the, the piece I know the most. So there are two things that I think we need to really invest a lot on. One is going after the top 10 or 20 pathogens, viruses, that are known to be at risk, and doing extensive work, doing all the preclinical pre -clinical work in animals, run phase ones, which is when you decide what dose do you need, and then run phase two to give you around a thousand people worth of safety. Because if we had done that for, for example, MERS or SARS, the first SARS, before the start of the year, when we got the sequence put online by the Chinese, we could have right away gone into a phase three. So instead, as Regina said, on March 16 to start a phase one, we could have started a phase three if we knew the dose and that already exposed enough people because it's only a few sequence change of a mutation. Right. So that's number one, preclinical and clinical work. And if you think about it, I will guess, estimate, it's around 20 to $40 million per virus. So times 10 or 20 virus, it is nothing at the global scale of a planet. The second thing is manufacturing. If we have had a big plant in Asia, a big plant in Europe, a big plant in Africa, one in the US, North and, North and Southern Hemisphere, that could make, let's say, $50 million a month you could have had, starting right away in January, right. make $50 million a month. That would make you around $400 million per plant by the summer. 
you have your phase three data in June, you'll have you know, 300 million doses per continent and vaccinate a lot of people. Think about the different winter we will go through right now. Stefan, I want to jump in because, right, I understand that we could reduce the, the timeline. Dr. Wu, come in on this because I think a big part of this discussion is, is it all about vaccines? Is it vaccines that save the world? I mean, the WHO came out yesterday and warning that they're not going to arrive in time for us to really deal with this second wave of COVID and that they should not be seen as a unicorn magic solution. Dr. Wu, are vaccines the answer to all of this? I think at this moment it's not yet. I think the uh, the question you asked about uh, how to uh, let this happen again, I think most of the urgent uh, question how to bring the epidemic uh, under control. It's uh, very urgent. So just to get the beginning of the winter, the number of cases continue to rise in the European countries, in the United States. The number of daily cases reached to over 60, uh, 600,000 per day. That's enormous. So when we get to the winter, the number of cases will continue. I think the public health measures like wear masks, social distance, hand washing, and ventilation, all of these public health measures are still the major effective measures to be used to control the epidemic. So the vaccine, it's a, a good message. It's a good uh, a technical weapons for control the epidemic. However, that cannot be used in the winter or cannot be brought the epidemic under control before next spring. So now we, we think we need to have two strategies go hand by hand, up the health at one hand and push vaccine at the other hand. Thank you. Regina, and I do wonder how you see this, because part of the problem, and this yeah. is the stories we've been dealing with at Bloomberg, is that this is great progress on vaccine news, but now we have to think about logistics, distribution, refrigeration, mm -hmm. and getting it out to developing economies where there are no, there is no infrastructure. So how do you see it in terms of the role of vaccines in all of this? Well, I think Dr. Wu makes a great point. And of course, the public health measures are very important for controlling the growth of the, of the epidemic. Now, I see these two things as going hand in hand. They're two pieces of the response. So the better job we can do in surveillance and detecting an outbreak, controlling it with public health measures, and the faster we can make a response in terms of a vaccine, those two things couple to make um, an even more important and uh, control measures. So the better we get at surveillance, the less pressure it puts on the response, the faster we can make a response, the less pressure it puts on surveillance. So if we just look at the timeline, as Stefan talked about, for a vaccine, imagine that it wasn't 12 months, but rather it was three months. What if using human tissue and organ strategies, we can do a much better job in the preclinical, we can tee up those kind of responses. And then as Stefan said as well, which I agree with, we need to do a better job on the manufacturing side and the delivery. Maybe we can get micro needles over the line. Maybe we can reduce the cold chain requirements. These are gonna require investments, much like the early investments we made in the mRNA based vaccine. And Stefan, forgive me, because you guys have been working tirelessly over at Moderna on this vaccine. And thanks to, you know, a few years ago, some investments from DARPA working with the government, you guys were, you know, started to do that early work on messenger RNA. So what are your thoughts as you're hearing this discussion about, you know, we talk a lot, too, about wear a mask, social distancing, about the importance of vaccines here? I mean, I totally agree with what Dr. Wu and Regina said. It's not a silver bullet. What we need is we need surveillance to be stronger. Uh, we need uh, public health measures because you have no other way at the beginning. This is your best weapon and you need to use it well. And I think when you look around the world, you have some countries that have done an excellent job, including, of course, China controlling the virus. And you have some countries where it's totally out of control. And when you still go today, you know, in some places and you see people, you know, going to crowded places with no mask, or eating inside restaurants with no mask, I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. It's like, you're going to get infected. The only question is when. And so uh, I think the vaccines are, are important. But it, what I was answering you, your question is, what can we do so that next time the timelines are much shorter? As Dr. Wu said, now the big impact is going to really be in the first quarter, in the second quarter, in the third quarter of next year. It will take time because we don't have enough product. But what I think we can do for next time 
is be able to go much faster, as Regina said, a couple months to approval of a vaccine. I think it is doable with the right investment up front. And then investing in manufacturing, because to stop those type of viruses, you need a very, very uh, high vaccination rate. And for this, you need a lot of, of doses. There's no other way around it. Dr. Wu, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you is you spent many years in California, so you kind of understand the U.S. culture, the U.S. systems. You've spent a lot of time in China. You understand that as well. So you really understand both countries and systems and how we operate. To be fair, uh, nobody had the playbook on this, and there were breakdowns in the U.S., there were breakdowns in China, there were breakdowns in Europe in terms of dealing with COVID-19. What can China do better next time around? What can the U.S. do better? What can the world do better? Uh, thank you for that question. I think it's very important for the public health measures. Uh, most important, it's a uh, country need to take action in the uh, same pace. That's most important. So I compare the culture between Asia and uh, Europe or uh, America. Uh, I think it's diff different. In the uh, Eastern uh, culture, we have a community value uh, is higher than the individual uh, value. Uh, in the United States and the European countries, the personal uh, right is the top priority. So given that, it's very hard to for people get uh, uh, have a common agreement. So I think for the respiratory diseases, the most important is everybody takes the order and follow the instruction take same action at the same pace. That's critically important. So if in a country, people have a different opinion and take action in a different uh, pace, that does not work for the control the <laughs> epidemic. For, for example, in the spring festival, the whole country shut down. It's a complete shutdown, not just part of people. Everybody stay at home for two weeks. So we compare strategies, similar strategy used in the European countries, like in the UK or in the other European countries, and also in the United States, some other states. However, not the whole country takes the same action at the same time. That will not work for control epidemic. So without get that compromise or get a agreement, it's very difficult to bring the epidemic under control. I want to bring up, if I can, the results of the poll. I think hopefully folks have been uh, answering those questions. And it, it asked, um, actually, I think we're not quite there, so hopefully people will respond a little bit more. So, Regina, let's, let's go on to, you know, how do we change behavior? How do we change maybe investments? How do we change priorities so that we are set up for the next global health crisis? Yeah, and I would say health in general, Carol, Right. So if you look at the response after Sputnik, what we saw was a dramatic shift in investment and also a focus on speed. And here, I think this is a place where we can really make progress. One of the things that I think will happen post this event is we recognize that we can go faster than we've done before. And we should because the slowness that we would have under different circumstances is a painful kind of slowness. It's the slowness that's measured in lives we could not save. So if you look at what happened after Sputnik, we saw a dramatic increase in investment. About 2.2% of US federal spending was focused on the frontier of space. About 80% of that was R&D. And it wasn't just the raw dollars, it was also the structure of organizations, deeper public Public private partnerships. DARPA was formed at that time. So we need more of that, and we need it in a multinational way. We need it internationally. I think that there's really important lessons there, not only for future pandemics, but also for battling depression and cancer and kidney disease. Much more to do there. If you look at the recent McKinsey study, what it suggested is that one to two, do one to two dollars worth of investment in health yields about two to four dollars in economic return. And that could be a $12 trillion uplift in global GDPs by 2040. It's a very important area of investment. It's not only a moral imperative, it is now an economic imperative.
You're right. And statistics, 10 million people die every year from cancer. Heart disease is responsible for the most, most deaths worldwide. Uh, diabetes, the numbers million. are just off the charts. I mean, it's kind of crazy. That's right. We, we do have the results of the poll, so I want to talk a little bit about that. The question was, what are the lessons from Asia's successful response to COVID-19? And if I take a look, mm, kind of an even split here. Check this out. 29 uh, percent, some individual freedom must be sacrificed for the public good. 27 percent, early lockdowns reduce overall economic impact. 16 percent, more investment in digital health infrastructure, including contact tracing. And 28 percent, face coverings work. I think that tells the story of how the world has been dealing. I think we all have mixed views, mixed feelings. Stefan, when you see those results, what do you think? Well, it's a bit disappointing that People don't realize that this is a respiratory virus. So masks work. Are they perfect? No. But do they help if I have a mask and I'm with other people and they have a mask? Do they help? Of course, tremendously. Uh, why do I wear a mask? It's not because I'm worried for myself. You know, I'm a 47-year-old. Uh, I have no comorbidity factor that I'm aware of. And so if I get, you know, SARS-CoV-2 infection, I have very little risk of dying from it. It's possible, but it's a low risk. But I don't wear a mask for myself. I wear a mask to, because I'm part of a community, of a society, and I need to make sure that I don't transmit this virus if I have it, because I would have an incubation time. I may be asymptomatic. I might have mild disease. But before I know that, I might give it to so many people that they then give it to other people and other people. It's exponential load. That's how viruses go. And it's, it's an act of, of civility in my mind to do that is for all the people we protect. I'm, by being infected, because I'm not responsible, I might get somebody 10 or 20 degrees of separation from me in the month or two dying because I was not responsible. And this is why we need to all play our jobs. Dr. Wu, I think about what's been going on in China and certainly the ability to control it, but it's been very different in terms of how it's been handled let's say, in contrast to the United States. But you guys have technology, you have an app, people can't get into buildings unless they're clear. So I do wonder, though, you give up, potentially Americans see it as some, some personal freedoms and some other global citizens may say, I don't want to be tracked, I don't want to be traced. I'm not thinking about the community. Um, your thoughts on that poll and, and kind of the response of how people are seeing it in terms of the lessons we've learned. Dr. Wu. Okay, I think we have a little technical problem and we'll hopefully get back to him. Regina, you come in on this in terms of, you know, I do think mm -hmm. about digital surveillance, right? Um, it makes no sense to have an app that tells you, I'm okay, I don't have COVID, I was just tested. But are we all ready as a world to give up our privacy and share our data? Well, I don't think those two things are necessarily mutually exclusive. I think we can do more on digital platforms and still protect privacy and use it to help in a severe situation like we had in the pandemic. And I think here, Google and Apple worked collaboratively to try and get a, a strike an appropriate balance between those two things. But here again, I think that we have to recognize that an early response um, really matters. We need a fire break when we start to see an epidemic emerging here. And that means public health measures, early detection, as well as the type of response and improving the speed of that response, even above the measures we've had in this most recent pandemic, beyond the 63 days and then a year or two of vaccine, we've got to get those timelines even shorter. And so one thing, and I don't know if we have Dr. Wu back, I guess we don't, but one thing I want to ask you all is what we've learned here in dealing with COVID-19, and if we can kind of broaden it out, um, Regina, you talked earlier about what McKinsey said, yeah. the cost of ill health at more than $12 trillion. I mean, this is a significant impact on our global economy and on the lives of people. So how do we deal with some of the big ailments that really stress our society right now? And Stefan, come on in on that. How do we make a better place when it comes to global health and as a result, really create prosperity around the world? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. And I think, it goes, oh, sorry, Georgia, ladies uh, first, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you for your graciousness, Stefan. Look, I think I've said some of it before. We need to shift our thinking. I think people are not going to be willing to go back to the speed with which we were making advances before. We've seen tremendous progress in health. 
we're just not seeing those breakthroughs fast enough. We need different structures. We need different types of investments. We need to embrace these public-private partnerships because the investment matters, both from a moral perspective and an economic perspective. Regina, so we've got... Regina, I, let me break in for a second. Though. What structure, yep. structures, what investments specifically? So here again, as I mentioned, in the early days of the space age, what we had is a dramatic increase in our R&D. Now, we recognize that dramatic increases are relative, right? But in the U.S. anyway, that investment went to about 2% of our federal spending. That would be about a doubling of our spending in the U.S. Um, as it relates to health. But if you imagine an organization like DARPA, which was formed after Sputnik, that organization has been responsible for big advances well beyond the space age. We're talking about the Internet um, as a communications platform. We're talking about laser technology and many other advances that are credited to the agency. And there's a particular style of investment there that is risk tolerant, that is multidisciplinary, that is uh, a blending of academic and as well commercial organizations, and we need more of that kind of investment so that we can accelerate mm -hmm. the breakthroughs. Dr. Wu, what kind of investments, what kind of structures would you like to see set, see set up that would prevent us from having another global health crisis? Well, I think uh, I have different opinion. Uh, look at the response to the COVID-19 in the science and technology. We responded very well. For example, it only took uh, less than a week. Scientists isolated the virus, determined the pathogen for the COVID-19. That's only about a week. Then take another few days, the, the virus uh, sequence was uh, discovered and shared with the world. And uh, looking at uh, the diagnostic test kits and vaccine de development, now it's only uh, about 11 months. We made a significant uh, progress in the scientific uh, understanding and the technology movement. All of this scientific finding technical movement provide a very strong weapon for control the epidemic. For example, uh, PCR diagnostic, diagnostic uh, test kit is powerful to determine the epidemic, to diagnose the patients. Now vaccine will soon to be uh, available for prevention. So look at our response to the COVID-19 uh, in the China and globally, we worked very well. I think the most important is a policymaker how to use this knowledge uh, to uh, empower the public to use this uh, knowledge and methods to control the epidemic. Yeah, I've heard so a lot of I that. Just, I, I feel, well, I just want to bring Stefan in, if I can, for a moment, too, yeah. on this conversation, because I do think about how does this ultimately change our health care priorities? We have someone from the audience asking about that. Stefan, how do we change things going forward? What do we need in our system structurally, money-wise, public-private partnerships? What do we need? Yeah, so I won't go back to what Regina or Dr. Wu said. We need more investment in science for all the reasons we talked about the last 30 minutes. But I think another piece that is not always talked about too much is the role of education, around the impact of food on health, the impact of doing exercise on health. I mean, look at it. Most people that are having severe disease or dying have comorbidity factors. And what are those? Diabetes, overweight, uh, blood pressure. Uh, and those, all the root cause of those things is lack, lack of having good foods and uh, exercise. And if you look at the demographics, a lot of minority groups are the most touched by it. And I think education and inequalities is, is a big issue in this in this health challenge we have as a, as a society, and I think we need to invest more there. Yeah, I think um, that is certainly something that has been laid bare once again about the inequities, whether it's access to health care or who gets impacted mm -hmm. by these health things. We only have about a minute 20 left. You've got to be quickly. Andy Brown asked a great question in the last segment. If you had a blank check, what would you spend it on? Stefan, just quickly, what would you spend it on? I will spend it on building manufacturing capacity for vaccines. I will build it to make sure we have override surveillance systems so that we can know those viruses very quickly and act quickly. Dr. Wu, just got about 30 seconds. What would you spend it on, a blank check, to make it a better world when it comes uh, to I global see. health? 
Yeah, I think the most important we need to have the global authority to coordinate, making sure the resources can be distributed to making sure uh, people who need can access to the public health service. And Regina, just to wrap it up, what would you spend it on? Well, I think the response today is based on a decade of investment that made it possible. I think we need more possibilities going forward. That's where I would spend it. All right. On that note, I'm going to leave it. Guys, thank you so much. We could probably talk for hours, for days. This is such an important issue of figuring out what we did and where we go from here to really tackle not only viruses, but really the global health situation. So Regina, Stefan, and Dr. Wu, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. A great, great conversation. And next up, we're going to go to a CEO spotlight conversation with Anne Wojcicki. She's co-founder and CEO of 23andMe, along with David Rubenstein. He's co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group. And thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, when COVID began to arise in the United States, did you realize that you had some information that could be uh, applicable to helping to solve COVID or identify what some of the causes would be? What did you do when you came to that realization? The first thing we realized is that one, um, we, we weren't gonna play a role in testing for all kinds of reasons. We're not set up to do COVID testing. But what we really are set up to do is to do research at scale. 23andMe has the world's largest consented platform of customers who are ready and engaged in research. So what we did on April 6th, we decided we were going to put out a COVID-related survey to our customers. And um, you know, a matter of weeks later, we had a million customers who had taken our COVID survey and we had over 20,000 individuals who said that they had had COVID, thousands who had been hospitalized. And by analyzing that data, we were able to find that there is a genetic, um, you know, there's a genetic type where O blood type uh, looks like it is protective, eight, you know, nine to 18 percent protective uh, from COVID. What about uh, people who are, let's say, uh, African American? Do they have a higher propensity to get COVID? Did you learn that as well, or not? We have seen that. And even when we have looked at, you know, adjusting for other components that, you know, other socio, you know, uh, you know, illnesses or other socioeconomic factors that we do see that there is a higher propensity of likelihood of them being sick. So that's part of the reason why we're continuing to do the genetic studies is because we want to, you know, we want to see what else we could find. And I just, just as background for people, um, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of viruses, there are genetic mutations in, in humans that make you either more susceptible or resistant. So for example, in HIV, there's a mutation called CCR5, where people who have that mutation are essentially immune to getting HIV. And when I look at sort of why certain populations are, are you know, getting sick more or some people um, you know, die or they seem to be exposed but not get it, it makes me think that there are going to be more genetic findings. So what did you do with this information once you got it? Did you give it to the FDA or give it to uh, CDC? Who did you give it to, if anybody? The most important thing for us to always do with our information is to publish as quickly as possible. And so we, we always put things when we feel like it's really important, we put it in a bio archive. So it means like the publication is out there now. So people can go and get access to this information. We also made the information available for any pharma company or any group that is working on this area to contact us and that we would engage in trying to help further um, any kind of research on a vaccine or treatments. We also, there's a number of consortiums that are out there with academics to try and bring all that data together. And we're partnering with all of those as well. So you have a lot of experience in dealing with FDA. Uh, to those uh, manufacturers of vaccines, what would you tell them about how to get through the FDA process? I would say the most important thing with the FDA is engagement and communication and, and finding people who have that expertise of um, you know the experience of how to work with them. The thing, the mistakes that we made in the past really had to do with a level of naivete on our behalf of how to communicate effectively with them. And it's one thing that I've learned with the FDA um, is you know when they when they have a vision, when they tell you they want this kind of a certain kind of analysis, there's there's not a lot of negotiation. Like you you, you follow what they are asking for. 
So in 2006, you started this company and your yeah. premise was that people would spit into a little vial of glass, mail it off, and you would tell them everything about their ancestry or about their health uh, predispositions. So did people tell you you were crazy at the beginning? Oh yeah, we had um, we had some really fun meetings with people where, um, you know, m my background is I, I was working, I was investing in healthcare companies and I saw the g genomics revolution taking off. And I was really disappointed in, from the time that the human genome was sequenced to, you know, you know, many years later that it still wasn't accessible to individuals. So I wanted to create a company that was going to be directly accessible to individuals with their genetic information. And, um, you know, in those early days, I had people, um, we were, you know, prohibited from being in medical meetings. I had people walk out of meetings with us. Um, you know, people thought, uh, you know, had all kinds of, you know, scary theories of what you would potentially learn with genetics. And I think what's happened is that people have really learned that your DNA is, um, it's like looking in the mirror for the first time. It's your digital representation of you. And it's really exciting. And the same way there's, you know, amazing things about you and there's things that you might want to change, your DNA is reflective of that. And so people are learning, you know, their, their ancestry is different than what a lot of people think. And they can understand, you know, families that have had, you know, heart disease in them or diabetes, they can look at their DNA and they can say, oh, there's potentially a genetic association. And what we've always wanted to do is to give people the tools to think about actually preventing disease rather than just treating it. And that's what we're really focused on now is how is it that you can learn all this information about you and inspire you now to take action to change your behaviors. So do people say to you, I want the results, but if there's a negative results, like I have a predis predisposition to dementia or Alzheimer's, don't tell me that. Do they do that or do you just give them all the information? We have the ability for some of the information that we know is more sensitive for customers, they have an additional opt-in. And that means that, for instance, on the Alzheimer's report that you reference, there's an additional layer of consent. So we don't just give it to you, but we say, hey, do you really want the information? Here's some background about what types of things you're going to learn. And then we then we allow you to get it. And I think that the thing I have always, again, my focus on healthcare has been um, about consumers having choice. And one thing that I have always found, frankly, offensive in the healthcare system is that other people are making choices for me. And what I think is really important is that you actually get choice. And it shouldn't be your insurance company, it shouldn't be your doctor, it shouldn't be you know the hospital administrator protocols. It should be about choice for you and giving you those opportunities to get that information if you want. And if you don't want the information, absolutely don't get it. Now, your initial premise was, I'm gonna tell you about your genetic background but you also have a business where you tell people about their ancestry in the sense of uh, who they're related to or might not have been related to. You find a lot of people find out that their biological parents weren't their biological parents or their biological siblings were not their biological siblings. And is that embarrassing or are they actually happy to learn this? It's one of the things that in the early days, we, um, I remember we, we would hypothesize, like wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually reconnect a family? And I would say we actually, on a daily basis, get um, dozens of stories of people learning that they had cousins that they didn't know about, they had siblings they didn't know about, um, and and you do find the the news that you know you're you might not be related to your father, that your siblings might be half siblings, and it's definitely um, you know it can be stressful for people to, to, to learn that. A absolutely, we have a whole website now dedicated for how people manage this. But overwhelmingly, what I am really happy about is how much this has connected people. And we find that people are, um, you know, making, making connections with their family and almost filling a hole in a void in their life that really bothered them. So for a lot of adoptees, so for instance, for us, my family, we actually found that we have a first cousin. And so I can relate to these stories. You know, here was somebody who, um, you know, didn't know his his you know his um, his birth parents, and he was an old, raised as an only child, 
and holy cow, suddenly he's now part of the Wojcicki clan and all of us. And, and so, and we had no idea that we potentially had this first cousin. So there's a, there's a whole process, but it's wonderful to find, you know, this family and, and to, and to connect and, and to see the similarities. Well, how many people have uh, given you their saliva to date? Over 12 million people. Wow. And do you it's get tired of, it's a lot. Now, do you get tired of people asking you, when are you going to take your company public so they can buy shares in it? <laughs> I actually, you know, it's, it's one of the things I think about. I would love to find a way for my customers to feel like they could be shareholders and be part of it. It's something that we've always thought about. Um, so no, I, I, again, I come from the Wall Street world. So I've, I, I know enough about um, being a public company to know there's no, there's no glory in having to, to, man, to, to you know, manage all of that work about being a, a public company. But at the right time, we'll absolutely um, you know, engage it. I think it's, it's important for a company to be public when they're mature enough to manage it. And I think what's been important for 23andMe is that we are very much of a mission-driven company with um, you know, a goal of creating a different type of healthcare ecosystem. And in order to do that, we're gonna have ups and downs. And it's better often to have ups and downs when you're a private company than when you're a public company. Well, telemedicine is now a reality. It is revolutionizing everything from making a doctor's appointment to developing vaccines and diagnostics. Our next panel takes a peek into the future in the age of digital health. Joining us right now is Lauren Gardner, Associate Professor, Department of Civil and Systems Engineering, Johns Hopkins Whiting School of Engineering, Nanda Nilakani, Chairman and Co-Founder, Infosys Limited, and Mike Wells, Group Chief Executive for Prudential. Bloomberg Television's Chief International Correspondent for Southeast Asia, Haslinda Amin, will moderate. All right, we're having a little technology uh, problems here, but we're going to hopefully get back to Aslinda. But we do want to talk about the digital health forum because this has been a big aspect, and we've seen uh, initiatives that are out there really kind of pick up speed as a result of COVID-19. So let's go first to Lauren. Lauren, how do you see this? What is going to be the role uh, when we think about digital health going forward? Because it definitely did pick up some momentum during COVID. Hi, thanks. Yeah. Um, it, it is a, it's a great question. I think that um, if there's anything that we've learned this year, it's really the value of information and the value of publicly available information. Um, and so as someone that's been leading the Johns Hopkins dashboard where we've been tracking coronavirus cases from basically early January, um, I mean, I think there's no question that there is this there was this huge untapped demand for this kind of desperation for real-time information from the public alongside the audience that we knew needed it, which is our research community, the public health community. And so um, making that kind of information available and making sure that there's an underlying infrastructure and system there to do this so that when these kind of events occur, whatever they are and whatever is causing them, um, that information is available to anyone that wants it so that it's not only available for actions and decision makers to be using to help guide how to address these situations from a policy perspective, but I think at the same time, we really want that information available to all the individuals so they can make better decisions on their own. Well, um, and I have to say, we have definitely lived by the Hopkins data, and I think the world has certainly, and certainly here in the United States, to kind of get a good snapshot of where we are. Nandan, I want to bring you into this because, you know, this is your world, uh, and taking a look at increasingly how technology is impacting everything that we do. And I think things like telemedicine, which were so slow in coming, all of a sudden there are more and more people doing it. How do you see it? What will be the digital impact when it comes to really healthcare globally? Well, I think uh, what we are seeing in healthcare is actually what we are seeing across the board, which is the dramatic acceleration of digital adoption, 
Uh, we are seeing that in e-commerce, we're seeing that in education and certainly healthcare also. And there are a number of facets to this. One is, of course, telemedicine or remote consulting where people are actually going online using some kind of a video conferencing platform to talk to the doctors and get some advice and so on. There's also been a dramatic rise in uh, online pharmacies where people are buying the drugs online, especially when they have chronic medicine and they want to get it much cheaper. And also, I think the vaccination is going to create a whole new opportunity because we, we are going to have billions of people getting vaccinated uh, in the next few years now with the phenomenal progress we're seeing on vaccines. And every one of them will need a digital vaccination certificate, uh, which they can uh, carry around with them when they travel to show that they've been vaccinated. And if you think of the uh, digital vaccination certificate as the first uh, electronic health record for people, then suddenly we have several million people who in the next two to three years will have electronic health records on a starter level. So I think the technology, uh, digital health has been impacting everything, telemedicine, online pharmacies, electronic health records, and of course the whole uh, extraordinary pace at which the vaccines are getting developed, the underlying stuff is all digital. You know, The whole genome sequencing was done within a month of this virus. By January, we already had the genome sequence. So I think the digital pervasiveness is everywhere. And you've called it a, a WhatsApp moment for healthcare, none done. I want to bring in Mike. Mike, for a company that's about 170 years old, it must have been quite a pivot. It, it, it was, but we, you know, we were about two years into a project to an end-to-end -end, uh, you know, di digital health ecosystem that has an artificial intelligence doctor, telemedicine, uh, some of the things we're talking about, uh, pharmacy delivery, all those sorts of capabilities in Asia. And I think there's a couple of things. I agree with the previous speakers. There's two or three major trends. There's, I, I, I think most people you run into, even socially, have a view now of what medicine can and can't do. And so there's a much more honest conversation with stakeholders on capacity and the role of patient, the role of provider, the role of payer, if that's a government or doctor, and then policymakers moving quickly for the, you know, feeling, all of them feeling aligned with COVID to do things differently. Uh, and again, you know, that that's created some some amazing innovations, as you know, I've already been mentioned, but it's also created uh, an intersect of the digitalization that you've seen in Asian health. Right. With the established markets, you know, primarily physical, traditional delivery models that are going very digital um, for a variety of reasons. But all of those stakeholders, you know, patient, provider, payer, uh, policymakers, all of them have moved massively. Um, through COVID, and I think all in the right direction. And and the fact that Asia started someplace very different than the Western markets, uh, you know, is is putting them on a different trajectory than, say, the U.S. or, or Europe. But they're all using the same tools that have been discussed by the other speakers. In the end, it is about data. Lauren, we talked about your COVID dashboard. Its success shows just how poor access to real data has been. What lessons have been learned in terms of how to collect, how to provide, how to share data so it is better the next time around? Yeah, I, we're absolutely still learning those lessons every day. Um, I have lots of strong feelings about the way that information should be made available and communicated and shared. So by far, our biggest challenge with this whole effort, which is, you know, on an hourly basis, we're pulling about 10,000 variables from 3,500 different locations around the world into this dashboard. And we're doing this in a world, in an environment where there is no standardization in place for what this data should look like. And, you know, we're focused for that, that particular dashboard on case and death data and, and recoveries, which is a whole nother ball game, but these aren't the only important variables and they don't tell the whole story at all. And the, the, it, the standardization issues get worse when you start talking about things like uh, testing positivity rates. Um, and so by far, the thing that needs to be in place is more standardization for exactly what variables should be reported, how they should be reported, in what formats, in what data structures, 
Um, they need to be publicly available in real time, you know, machine readable because we can't go around and check all these websites and enter the data manually into some spreadsheet and upload it. So I think that making sure that this kind of information, um, which I understand, you know, it, it isn't necessarily something that has to contradict any privacy concerns at all, because what we're collecting is anonymized aggregated level data. And there's a lot that can be done with that. Um, and so I think it's just having a culture and a system in place so that that's, that's always available in a way that's usable. Uh, so it remains very challenging. Nandan, what's the role of the private sector in advancing this digital health care? Where do you see, uh, I guess, uh, the biggest advancement that can be made? No, I think the private sector has a huge role. I mean, uh, governments have to define policies, set standards, uh, data privacy rules, and so on. But a huge part of the delivery of all these things will be done by the private sector. Uh, Mike talked about what they're doing in Asia, a program called Pulse, which has done very well. Uh, and I think uh, private sector has a huge role. And I, I think to Lauren's point, I think we now need to start looking at standardization of the vaccination process, because so far the focus has been on testing cases, recoveries. But as we start vaccinating, we'll also need a lot of real-time data from around the world, especially because many of these vaccines have been uh, will go in with emergency authorization. So we need to very quickly figure out which ones are doing badly, which ones are having side effects. And that's all data. So I think having learned the lesson about the uh, standardization in testing and so on, I think since the vaccination is still a few months away, it's a good time to start thinking of standardizing vaccination data so we have a much better grip on how it's being rolled out globally. Mike, for you, what data are you collating? For the markets you're in, like Asia, like Africa. Yeah, so we're very, we're very careful on the on, on leaving the client uh, health data with the client. Uh, so to Lauren's point, it's aggregated data on policy, and we share that with the ministers of health and things in the countries we're working in. Um, but again, it's it's at a level that's anonymized. Um, there are challenges. I mean, I, you know, there's two things Lauren said I'd strongly agree with. One is people want to know this. We've had 12 million downloads of this app in Southeast Asia. Um, basically since, you know, no, end of November last year, now in t 10 languages. I think th they are using the tools, one of which was developed in the UK, Babylon, uh, which is a artificial intelligence doctor in the UK. You can replace your GP with it. And it was built off the NHS's database, which is, if you think from a researcher point of view, quite unique because it's an entire country's health records. So, you know, there's some incredible quality of, of research that can be done on that. So a solution from that market going into these other markets as a symptoms checker. And, you know, if you're in Southeast Indonesia and the closest doctor is two hours away, do you make take the day off work or not? Those sorts of decisions are now made on someone's mobile device, which I think is tremendous. The challenge, though, that's coming and it's telemed, it's pharmacy things, the doctors is uh, consumers really like the telemed experience, uh, particularly our Asian clients. And it's efficient and it's safe. Uh, but you know, data is not allowed to move across markets in, in, most in, in most countries in Asia. Often the consumer doesn't own their health data if they've been to a hospital in certain markets. So there's got to be a standardization of policy around what the client can and can't keep, what's portable, what's transferable, and whose licenses, say, as a medical provider work across borders. But there's discussion on that now. And again, these are the kind of discussions that are more frequent because of COVID. Lauren, Nanda, this one's for you. Lauren will go first. It's about breaking data silos to encourage innovation. How do we do that? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of that can come from the fact that we need data from so many different types of sources. And so if we can come up with some kind of better mechanisms and structure and system and standardization, then ideally this can be adopted across the board. And so I just, I want to echo something that was already brought up and we've been thinking about for months, I mean, for at least six months is when vaccine, when vaccines come out, it's going to be so critical to understand how those are getting out and getting, um, adopted and deployed and what impact they're having. And there's going to likely be multiple vaccines and they might each have different kind of 
targeted audiences. And we are waiting to be able to collect that data. And unfortunately, we have no idea how that's going to show up, who's going to provide it, the quality of it. Um, and this goes all the way up to things like if there was another you know, pandemic or infectious disease that started tomorrow. We built this whole infrastructure over the last year. And unfortunately, a lot of it isn't even directly transferable to another infectious disease because the system isn't in place. So I think you need all of these different players that are contributing information that's relevant for the same problem to be working together and understand that the data needs to provide be provided in a certain way in some systematic way so that it can be useful. Nandan? Well, I think, uh, I think uh, when we look at data, there are different parts of it, right? One is there's the whole aggregate anonymized data with which you do surveillance or trend analysis and, uh, and, and generally that kind of stuff. And then there is the individual's personal uh, data, which often has to be uh, private. And one of the things uh, which has been developed in India is the concept of account aggregators, which are essentially an architecture that allows individuals to take charge of their own health records. So they, they, they can get their health record from their hospital, from the provider, you know, from their drug agency, from the testing, from the specialist. And then they can take that data in a portable manner and give it to somebody else to have a look at. So I think ultimately uh, the health records will have to be built in a way that individuals are empowered uh, to take their own data and move it around. Uh, so portability, interoperability is very important. At the same time, we need to be able to extract from that mass of data, uh, anonymized data for trend analysis and other medical purposes. And of course, that data should also be used in an anonymized way for AI purposes. So I think there's different ways to, to look at the data. But clearly we have a massive need for standardization. And uh, I, I'm worried that the vaccination will again have the same issues. There'll be no standards and everybody will be doing it differently. And we won't be able to really collate everything together very well. We'll pick up on standardization slightly later, but right now I want to take a look at regulation because it is one of the issues that needs to be looked at. Governments everywhere were already working on new rules to facilitate digital healthcare even before COVID-19. Now it's been expedited. How far has regulation caught up with technology? Nanda? Well, I, th I think there is a tremendous effort right now to catch up with technology. We saw that in the vaccine development. I mean, the way they were able to compress the vaccine development to less than a year is precisely because regulators responded to the situation. Uh, they started giving emergency authorization, concurrent uh, evaluation, a whole host of things to crunch time. So I think one of the big things that COVID has done has made regulators also extremely aware of the time consequence of their actions. And therefore, I think uh, regulators around the world now are moving far more swiftly, far more agile, far more flexible. And I think that's a great thing, not only for this COVID, but in future also as we face other medical challenges, the resilience and flexibility of regulators has become a big positive. And Lauren, is there true disruption in how governments are reacting to new technologies in healthcare? Uh, I think it, it's hard to answer that because it's so different country to country. I mean, it really, it really depends. Our experience working with different countries, trying to um, collect information and communicate with them and understand what the real situation is on the ground is, is really challenging, challenging and varies pretty dramatically place to place. So I do think there's a broad recognized need for this kind of regulation. And I think in some places it's been better developed and implemented than others. Um, but I do think there's still uh, kind of quite a bit that needs to be done in most places. And Mike, isn't it true that we have strict regulatory environment for safety and efficacy standards? So we have to go slowly, slowly in effect. I, I think we have to be careful. I don't think, you know, the slowly, slowly is, if you think about, uh, if we'd have asked Lauren's team to, to, to look at 10,000 pieces of data every, you know, uh, you know, she said hourly, you know, if you'd have said that amount of data 10 years ago, how, long, how many hours would it take you to process 
you know, a million, a million pieces of data, it would have been a very different period of time than it is today. So I think the infrastructure to process information for policymakers has accelerated as it has for, you know, for private companies and as it has for consumers. And, you know, one of the trends that's behind a lot of the consumer adaption, I think, of, of digital is this the ever increasing capability of, of the mobile devices. I mean, 5G on the horizon now in most markets and, you know, suddenly things take an entirely different feel to them, uh, you know, and in a higher level of gamification and things coming. But from a policy point of view, you know, I deal with a lot of policymakers across Asia and, and both health and, and finance, and they're all concerned about health inclusion. They're all concerned about financial inclusion. They see the two intersecting um, and they, you know, there's a lot of push for us to stay with their policy ambitions as well as for a challenge for us to make sure that the privacy is right, the quality, the interaction. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a market, for example, that during COVID, the regulators have not allowed uh, our agency bank or digital channels to sell in a format like we're talking today. So those, you know, those approvals are all, in, we're all within a few months. Um, so I think they're being very active. I think they're very challenging. There's some very unique models, you know, across Asia. Um, you know, we have we have regulators that have uh, investments in tech firms. You know, in the case of Singapore. Um, so, I mean, there, there's some very sophisticated regulatory looks at digital, and I, I don't do a meeting with a with a policymaker where it isn't a major part of the agenda, and they're pushing us to include more of the population. When we launched in Malaysia, for example. You know, we, they wanted assurances in the government that we would include the bottom 40 at no cost of the population to the technology we're rolling out. That's a great role for us. And I'm glad to do it. But that's the sort of dialogues that are occurring. And, and I think they're they're committing a tremendous amount of resources to staying with digital solutions in both finance and health. The, the, th the thing is, Mike, is that technology is evolving so quickly. You almost need a more flexible framework of regulatory uh, environment. Is there a fair, fair assessment to make? Always true. And I think the you cannot write a policy that regulates ethics at the end of the day. I mean, people are going to do the right thing or they're not going to do the right thing. And, you know, the, the uh, uh, I, I've watched this across most of my career with financial innovation things and health innovations. You know, they, they, they can and should expect private sector players to behave appropriately ahead of regulation. Um, and, and, you know, you see retroactive regulation in lots of markets when that hasn't happened. You see, you know, the consumers wanting personal liability of, of uh, leaders when, they, when they've you know, done things that, that socially we, we, we think are wrong. Um, I don't think you can expect the policymakers to envision every use of every tool that technology can create. I think they can set standards and they can hold expectations high and they can expect transparency from companies and then have the infrastructure, the bandwidth to measure and look at what we're doing. And that's that's been our experience to a great degree. Nandan Ali, you talked about global standards. Where are we on global standards? What are the risks given the lack of consistent data privacy standards and storage protocols? Well, I think, uh, uh, it, I think in the pace at which things have changed, we don't really have standard. But I'll give you a simple example of something which I think we should have a global standard which is the a digital vaccination certificate. Now, why is this important? Because if we want to vaccinate uh, billions of people very quickly, we also want them to have a portable, interoperable, verifiable certificate which they can carry with them, either on their phones or on the cloud or, or on a hard copy. Because we want people to start traveling, start moving, going to, going to the airport, going to a new country. And everyone will be asked to prove that they have actually been vaccinated before they are allowed into the restaurant or the country. And therefore, having an interoperable digital certificate would be a great standardization that we can do. So I don't think we need to think about everything. But even if we can bring in, a, and you know, already the WHO has international health regulations, but they were last updated about 12, 13 years back, and they don't really, they were not really designed for the digital world. So just focusing on a digital health certificate, which is a global standard, interoperable, portable, authenticatable in real time anywhere, itself will have a dramatic impact on reviving the world economy and society post-COVID vaccinations. How realistic is that, Lauren? I mean, it's so fragmented. 
if we can agree on whether to wear a mask or not, I mean, what are the chances that we can agree on data privacy issues? I want to be optimistic about it, but yeah, I think it's a huge <laughs> challenge because I, I mean, I think that even getting a country to do it, and I mean, the U.S. is it's complex in itself, right? We have data that we need to be standardized, not only from the national level, but also from the state level and also from the county and city level. I mean, in the U.S. alone, we have 3,200 counties and they're doing things differently. So it's hard to think that we can expect 200 countries who have very different priorities and resources to all be on the same page, but it's really important. And there are some basic things that I think this this can be managed for. I mean, just in terms of notifying um, publicly when certain types of things happen and doing that in a certain way. But it's it's a it's a huge challenge, and I'm not sure who's in the position to enforce it. Mike, your take on it as you navigate the different markets that you operate in. Yeah, no, I've been in, uh, I was just counting, I've been in six countries in the last three months. Uh, I think I've been tested a dozen or more times. And, uh, you know, to the point where I'm, you know, I see that, I see that stick coming at me and I shake a little, a little bit. Uh, I think there's a, uh, uh, you, the, the bizarre thing is, is you hand them a piece of paper, right? As you, as you enter these countries and you go into quarantine. And, and so the current alternative to a, 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 a st digital standard is that, eight and a half by 11 or an A4 sheet of paper that says this testing center says I'm okay. Um, from a data integrity, a fraud, uh, you know, risk point of view, that's just, it's just not acceptable. We've got to do better than that. And, and I think the other one that you see that, you, you, you know, we haven't brought up is, and there's quite a, a discussion, I think in the U S more than the markets on this is contract tracing. So, you know, I have multiple apps from different countries that ask you to have contract tracing when you're there. Um, you know, when I'm in the States and I'm talking to friends, they think that's a lot of them think that's a very bad idea that yet they have no issue with social media platforms, Google, Apple, et cetera, you know, prompting their, their consumer needs based on their location and their, and their, you know, web search activity. So there's a, there's a social buy-in to this that's different in different countries, but I, I could not agree more I, with none is coming. I think this, we have got to quickly get to a better standard or a, or a handful of standards on this sort of health passport idea, because the idea that I can, you know, I bring a piece of paper with me that, that uh, you know, an immigration officer or a health officer is supposed to understand as a hospital in the United States or the UK is, is you know, to me, a standard that just isn't acceptable. We can do better than that. So Nandan, how do we bridge the different attitudes, the data privacy between East and West, for instance? Well, you know, I mean, just to focus on the uh, vaccination certificate, I want to make two points. One is the world already has the concept of uh, interoperable vaccination certificate, you know, and that's already uh, embedded in the international health regulations put out by the WHO. For example, when you're visiting a country in Africa, you have to go with a proof that you've taken the yellow fever vaccination, which you get done in your own country, and they gave you a certificate, which you then show at the airport when you land. So the concept of a vaccination certificate, which is interoperable across borders, is already there in our global society. What I'm saying is we now need to make that a digital certificate so that we can carry it on our phones or on the, on the, on the cloud. The second thing is that a vaccination certificate has no privacy issue because I actually want to show you that I'm vaccinated. I'm like, you know, it's not about privacy anymore because it's actually about my, my vaccination certificate it helps me to go somewhere else. It, it improves my life. It helps me to do my job. So I think people will be very proud to show their vaccination certificates whenever they travel. I don't see a privacy issue at all, especially with vaccination certificates. I want to take the discussion forward, look into the crystal ball. The pandemic has exposed flaws in almost every single healthcare system in the world, but it's also radically revolutionized telemedicine. I mean, what will be the next phase of digital health? How will it look like? Lauren. <sighs> uh, well, one thing that I think is obviously going to be a component of it is going to going to be all of these 
immediate access um, to publicly available information. I just don't really foresee a world ever again where there's any kind of regional, national, or global um, kind of health crisis that happens where the information on what is going on isn't available in a really accessible way to anyone that wants it. Um, and so I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things we've learned here. And while there were institutions in place that were providing this information before, they were doing it at different scales that maybe weren't as actionable, or they were making the information available in ways that weren't really as accessible and usable to just kind of the common individual. And we've found that those are the people that really need the information to have it, to act on it, or making that same available information same information available equally to everybody and making sure that it's um, it's transparent in terms of where it's coming from. And Mike, uh, Lauren talked about how we should make it available for everybody, a more equitable society, digital healthcare for a more equitable society. How do we get there? What are you doing in terms of your own initiatives? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, uh, you know, you, you are not going to have uh, effective societies if you don't you don't have reasonable levels of health inclusion right start start with that as I think an, uh, you know a, a basis for this so an artificial intelligence symptom checker or doctor if it's in the UK um, can do two things it can provide for effectively at no marginal cost if you will um, it, it can give an individual the ability to do a basic checkup and then forward that data accurately to a telemedicine provider or then to a, a traditional provider. And in that process, they get to the doctor sooner or don't go if they don't need to. It's a bit of a triage element. It, it manages the finite capacity we have in traditional care. And, and, and to be clear, the emerging markets and developed markets have huge capacity issues, you know, as COVID's uh, laid bare, right, on healthcare. We have, we have increased the number of people in, in Asia that can afford healthcare. We've increased the number People in the U.S., for example, that are available to health care um, to the Affordable Care Act. And we haven't materially increased the number of doctors and nurses and hospital beds. Now, you are seeing great expansion of infrastructure in some countries in Asia, but again, not keeping up with the demand. So the proposition has to change between the consumer, the access to the provider, right, and the complexity of it. And, and you know, it was brought up earlier, digital wallet. There's tremendous inefficiency and ineffectiveness and people going from doctor to doctor. If you think of, uh, all of us have probably had the experience of taking an older parent or someone you care about to the doctor because the conversation is complex and they need an advocate in the room to make sure the message from one appointment to the next carries over. That's all easily done digitally. So I think the experience changes and it's for the better. We have very little time left. I just wanna get to our polling question. And the question is, which tag would most effectively improve quality of life? A, 5G-enabled telemedicine, B, wearables and personal health monitoring tech, C, genetic and diagnostic analytics using AI, and D, mindfulness and meditation app. Very quickly, Lauren, your choice. Uh, I think um, the wearable tech only because the third one doesn't seem possible without collecting that information in the first place. Mike? I'm going to say the third, but I think wearable tech for the growing uh, challenges we're facing in Asia with diabetes and so, so that that's going to be a, a, a big breakthrough, I think, in that space. So I think both to me would be even. I know that's not a definitive answer, but I think solving two different issues, general health care, the third wearable tech for for diseases like diabetes, which are a major concern post-COVID. And Nanda? Uh, I would go with the 5G telemedicine, mainly because I think in uh, many of the countries, uh, uh, many people don't have smartphones and they don't have connectivity. And therefore, wearable tech works when you have connectivity where you can transmit uh, what's happening. So, I, I mean, in the long term, yes, but in the short term, 5G telemedicine is my choice. A vibrant discussion. Nanda and Mike, Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Haslinda, thank you so much. We're going to stay with the digital health theme for now in our new economy, Health Game Changer. In rural India, the challenge of providing health care to people living miles and miles away from the nearest hospital or even the nearest doctor has had life and death consequences. The CEO of Global Healthcare System set out to come up with a solution to this problem. Take a look.
In India, 28% of India's population did not have access to a doctor. On the poor side, in the rural areas, in the underserved areas, in the remote areas, clearly there is a challenge that healthcare doctors are not available, facilities may not be available, and people may have less money. So doctors migrate and go and start working and practicing in larger and larger hospitals in bigger cities. So that was the reason that we said, let's try and see that we can create a better model than between the private and the public, something which can meet the clinical outcomes as well as being affordable for people. Dr. Azim founded Glocal Healthcare in 2010 after realizing there was a rural healthcare gap that needed to be filled. But in order to be sustainable from a business perspective, it needed to have a low overhead and be incredibly efficient. His answer, technology. So how do you ensure that everybody gets healthcare across the world? So here comes in telemedicine. So today's technology allows you to do rich video between a doctor and a patient and connect them like an Uber across where patients might be and doctors might be. That's step one. Step two is medical data is huge. It is vast. So we built a clinical decision support system that basically ensures that doctors are able to do better diagnosis, that drug interactions, dosages, uh, contraindications, drug interactions, everything is actually sorted out and doctors can focus on the patient rather than trying to think through the data. The third is now I need to be able to examine the patient and I may be sitting far away, I may be sitting in New York for that matter or Bangalore for that matter and a patient may be in Orissa. So Internet of Things today allows you to get data and transmit it across. The mini clinics like the one here called Hello Life CX cost around 25,000 US dollars to build and can be set up in under a day. Glocal has 240 of them around India, as well as 11 larger hospitals with emergency services in rural areas. Including the app, the company is one of the largest telemedicine operators in the world. So to solve the problem of the poor, it's a bad thing to do when you think of putting in a cheap thing. You have to be able to put the most expensive piece of technology which can create so much of productivity that the product itself can be cheaper in the hands of the person. Africa, we know, is grappling with a health crisis and a sharp economic contraction as a result of pandemic lockdowns. Nevertheless, the early predictions of famine, economic and social collapse on the continent were clearly overblown. Now, when the speakers on our next panel, they were all old friends. When they finished recording our conversation, they actually kept talking and they ended up having a fascinating conversation while our cameras were still rolling. And we thought we'd start there the conversation. We are pleased to welcome speakers Aliko Dangote, founder and co-chairman of Dangote Group, Grasa Michel, chair of the Mandela Institute of Development Studies and former Mozambique Minister of Education, and Strai Masayiwa, founder and executive chairman Econet, an African Union spe special envoy with moderator Zain Bergi, who is founder and CEO of the Zain Bergi Group. What happens when you put three of Africa's top leaders in a room to figure out solutions? The conversation is real, it's dynamic, it's forward thinking, and a little bit humorous. Hey, Gracia, you look radiant as usual. I'm going to tell the girls that you are still number one on fashion. <laughs> That's very kind of you, but you know, <laughs> me, I'm here always, I mean, speaking on the human face of all these tragedies and the human capacity of response. That's my strength. And I think that's what really, with a continent like ours, there's no substitute. <laughs> you will live forever. <laughs> <laughs> we need you, you need us to, 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 to continue to lead without your support as a private sector, but supporting our heads of state and our ministers, etc. 
I mean, we wouldn't be where we are. And it was important to tell this to the world, what Africans have been doing for themselves, of course, with connection and with support of the rest of the world, but what Africans have been doing for themselves. So that's a, a strong message. And I think it's part of the reason why we didn't reach the levels of tragedy which were being anticipated. Yeah. yeah. And you know, every yeah. single thing that people have tried to say to explain why our numbers are, are so low, you end doesn't add up. You always end up in a place. You know, I finally said to somebody, you know, if you tell me it's a miracle, I will accept. Because when we started, the numbers, the projections, what we were dealing with were just terrifying. Yes, uh, yes. And the, you know, people said black people will not die, but black people died in America. They died in, in mm -hmm. Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they say, oh, because your people are young, but we still have 500 million people, old people, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, the thing is, but it's been know, an uh, absolute miracle. Strive, when you look at it, you see that uh, a lot of us were all used to malaria. A lot of people will always have malaria and they'll be going around without them knowing that they really have, uh, you know, malaria. And part of the system uh, is actually having malaria. And I think uh, there must be something with our DNA that has actually helped in terms of protecting us from uh, dying from COVID. Uh, some people say that, no, no, because we are not testing. I say, okay, even if we are not testing, you would have seen retinue of people lining up at hospitals complaining about fever or coughing or whatever, you know, and we don't have that. All the hospitals, in fact, to tell you the truth, now 90% of the isolation centers that we built, they are closed down. You know, we don't have any, uh, you know, I mean, people have recovered. We only have uh, less than uh, 1,000 200 people or so that are still, you know, in isolation centers. We, we still have to, to, to dig deep to understand the impact that we have been going through one pandemic after the other pandemic and the other pandemic without the world realizing that Africans are going through all these many pandemics, which is the malaria, which Alip is talking about, HIV, which uh, we all know and the strive spoke about. I mean, deprivation in which we have been living, it's another pandemic. And all these things perhaps have developed along the times some sort of resilience in us. It is true that what was anticipated for to have people lining up to go to hospital, it didn't happen. Perhaps there are people who are being infected, but they continue to do their life as if they were not infected, as they continue to do with their life with malaria, with HIV, with the hunger, with, you know what I mean? So all these factors, but I think it's too early for us to, to know exactly how we had this kind of resilience. It is true that we are not out of this, uh, um, of this pandemic, but the problem is that some parts of the world are beginning to uh, design and even to redefine what is the post pandemic. And I think we have to be doing both. While we still have to continue to save lives, we need also to be saying, how is it going to be in a way we don't continue to do the things like before because the post-COVID is being planned, is being redesigned, it's being re restructured. Across the globe, there are already people who are thinking of that. And we need to have ourselves already doing both, saving lives, but thinking what we have to do best from lessons we have so that the future is not going to be like yesterday and the future is not going to be like today exactly. So it's, it's just to, 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 to play with the ability. And I wanted to say something which is also very important. I didn't say before. Women's leadership. You know, it's not by chance that countries which did best globally, they, were led, they are led by women. And I think that's important also. In our case, we need to look at how women's leadership is to be 
side by side with men. I'm not saying that we have to throw away the men. <laughs> but I think one of the issues is to bring women's leadership at the center as well of the post-COVID, of the reconstruction, and the reshaping of what our continent is going to look like in future. Let me tell you one of the big lessons here. When the Ebola crisis occurred, okay, yes, yeah. the then chair of the African Union was Dr. Nkosazana Zuma from South Africa. And she called me and she said to me, we need an African response. Can the African private sector help? I reached out to the African private sector. And I, what many people don't know is there were seven envoys then, all from the private sector, which included myself and Aliko. And what Africa learned at that time was the leadership reservoir that sits in the private sector to act, respond, and support. So on this occasion, the president just had speed dial to a group of us. And for example, Aliko's group sitting in, in Nigeria, we work very closely with them. In these groups, we have uh, uh, the guys in Kenya, uh, all working together, their private sector. So the most beautiful lesson for Africa from this has been that it can rely on its private sector. In the past, it was believed that we were just there to make money. The population no longer sees it that way. They see us as entrepreneurs, as an integral part of the society, able to drop what we are doing, able to make serious uh, sacrifices, to go out and to help, to use what we have. So, it's, so I think this is really, really important because even if you look at the current group of seven envoys, we're all private sector people um, and we work very, very comfortably with the governments. Of course, some of my colleagues like uh, uh, Ngozi, uh, great woman leader, as you know, um, uh, and Tijan Tiam and uh, Donald Kabaruka and Trevor Manuel, okay? These are all great leaders who've been in government and been in the private sector. But I think that's a big takeaway. You can trust your private sector. That's the lesson that Africa has taken from this, that we are not just there to make money. We are there to build communities, to build livelihoods, and to protect our people. You know, really, you are right. Uh, during the Ebola, we helped, uh, you know, tremendously. I mean, I remember when you spoke to me, we even gave uh, the African Union, you know, for the three countries, I think it was Guinea, Conakry, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia. I think we gave them Liberia. $3 million. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, we built the infectious mm -hmm. center here in Nigeria. So private sector can always come together and say, well, this, we don't really need to look for help outside the continent. And uh, I agree with my sister, you know, Gracia Michelle, that I think we need to really have like a conference to see okay, how do we really get together so that if there is any crisis, we can always just come to uh, the rescue of our continent. And what we generally find as well, because the private sector has stepped forward, you, it's now easier even for partners like Bill, Bill Gates and others who, who work with us. They know how to reach to us and how we work together to get things done. So um, all in all, I think that um, that's, that's been one of the unsung uh, developments of this situation. Look, uh, when the dust settles, as I say, when we are able to get this thing uh, under control, uh, let's have those conferences. Um, we all would love to talk about what we did right and what we did wrong, you know, so that the future generations can build on that. Okay, we we'll look forward to that. What do you think is our biggest challenge right now? 
myself. Challenge in terms of what? Oh, the I'm big, very the biggest clear challenge on right. this. The, we, the number one challenge, uh, Zain, is ensuring that vaccines arrive on time and equitably. Okay, the way the whole approach to vaccines, don't be fooled. People have hoarded vaccines in the background and then come and pretended that they, let's now have an equitable conversation about vaccines. Um, so the whole issue of vaccines, uh, making sure that there's equitable access on time, uh, which looks at all life as being equal, okay, is the big issue. And we're going to have a big fight about this. And we will continue to have a big fight about it until this thing is over. Mr. Dangote, how has Africa been impacted by COVID? Well, Africa has been impacted by COVID in two folds. One is the uh, human side and one is the economic uh, side. On the human side, really, because, uh, you know, people normally go out and look for the day's, uh, you know, uh, meal. I mean, people have to work on Monday for their, you know, for their feeding of Tuesday, which means people live hand to mouth, majority of people. And the lockdown really deprived people from going out there to look for their daily, uh, you know, uh, break. So on the economic side, because we have locked down, so even moving from one state to another state became very, very, very uh, almost impossible. So that really impacted us economically. You know, people were not able to operate. People were not, uh, you know, able to uh, know airlines were not flying, you know, anywhere. So that really impacted us both human and economically, you know, but I think uh, things have actually, you know, turned out, uh, you know, to be much better now, you know, because this period of 20th of March to end of May was really very, very tough. And that's why we had to intervene as a private sector to do a lot of palliatives because people couldn't really go out there. They couldn't go to the farm. They couldn't go to their factories. So everything was shut down, and that really had a massive impact on the uh, economies of Africa. And it was expected, uh, Grasa Michel, that Africa's health systems were going to be so weak that they would crumble and the continent would be facing utter catastrophe. That didn't happen. It wasn't the case. Why? Remember that Africa was hit by the wave of covid last than Europe. So our heads of states and leaders, they had a bit of time to prepare and taking lessons from what was happening with the catastrophic consequences in Europe. They were aware that we didn't have health systems which were strong enough to lean overly on them. So they invested in preparing people, messaging to people that we have to take care of ourselves. Of course, they have also to take the drastic measure of lockdown. Economically speaking, lockdown was terrible to economy, but it, heads of states, they had to make a choice between saving lives or keeping the economy going. And in my understanding, they made the right choice. They declared lockdowns in most of countries. People continue to be educated. And because of that, preventive measures are the ones which helped Africa really to get out of this conflict with much less death as we have, and even in infection rates which are less than what you could see in Europe and in the United States. So I would say one, Lessons learned from those who were hit first. Second, preventive measures which were taken by our, our leaders and investing in messaging and educating people to know that only each one of us and all of us together can prevent a catastrophe and a disaster in people's lives. But economically, as Aliku was saying, the consequences are still going to be with us for much, much long time. 
Let's dig into that a little bit more with Strive Masiwa, who is one of four African Union envoys dealing with COVID. Can you give us a little bit of uh, behind the scenes insight, some color into what the envoys in the African Union uh, have, have been discussing over the past few months and taking action on specifically with your remit, which is supply chains? Give us an insight into what you've been doing. Uh, thank you, Zain. Um, you know, when the crisis hit, um, I was called by President uh, Ramaphosa, who is the chair of the African Union, the rotating chair. And he asked me to take what is basically a full-time job as a special envoy to help coordinate a continental response. We are actually seven envoys. Um, and we work virtually full time. We are working every single day. We are the ones behind the coordinated response to shutdown, the lockdowns. Uh, we work very closely with the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is part of the African Union. And look, as Gracia pointed out, we the science, uh, our own scientists were telling us uh, what the threats were and what the dangers were. Uh, President Ramaphosa has a task force of heads of state. Uh, there are 10 heads of state uh, who are the chair of the regional bodies of Africa, the regional organizations and uh, head also the national, the continental security structures. And we report into that virtually every two weeks. And um, so, you know, it's been a lot of work um, coordinating with the governments, with the ministers of health, the ministers of finance. We're trying to deal both with the, uh, the, the crisis of the disease itself trying to keep down the death rates and doing the testing, ensuring that our nurses and our doctors have PPE and so forth. And also the catastrophic economic implications. But I'm sure we can talk about that later. Well, let, let's get into some of the work that the private sector has been doing on the continent. As a Kenyan, I'm, I'm very proud to see uh, the unbelievable ways in which the private sector has come together in, in multiple countries and, and different regions. And I would like to look at Nigeria specifically, Mr. Dangote, because you've played a specific hands-on role in bringing the private sector together in Nigeria, partnering with governments as well. Could you describe for us a little bit about what you've done and and how the private sector came together. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zen. I think what we did as uh, private sector, myself and uh, you know a good friend of mine, the governor of Central Bank, what we did was actually to create what you call COVID, which is coalition against COVID. And uh, we called some few of our colleagues in the private sector we raised about $112 million, you know, to try and partner and complement government in what they are doing, you know, because things are really tough and government couldn't really do it uh, on their own. So what we did was that uh, we raised $112 million. We built 39 isolation centers, of which the smallest is about uh, 100 beds fully equipped uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the equipment that you can think of. And then we bought millions of uh, PPEs. I think we bought about uh, almost 12, 15 million of PPEs. Uh, you know, we bought a lot of sanitizers. And then we also do palliatives because we realized that people were actually locked down. They were not able to go out there and feed themselves. So we spent the entire $112 million in building isolation centers and then buying palliatives. The palliatives, what we did, was to target the rock bottom of the pyramid, you know, which is now to, uh, you know, target 5% uh, of the population, which is 10 million people. That means 1.7 million households. And we did uh, quite a lot, giving them rice and other stuff, you know, something that equates to about almost 50 kg per family. And that's what we did. 
and that really helped quite a lot. And uh, we're able to uh, really, really contain the, uh, I mean, mitigate the hardship because there was really a lot of hardship during the, uh, you know, lockdown. The other hardship that has had to be endured has been on women, on girls, on adolescents. Uh, globally, it's been quite concerning and devastating in many parts of the world, and, and Africa hasn't escaped that. Grasa Michelle, could you give us some insight into those three segments, women, girls, adolescents? How have they been impacted? I'm glad that you are bringing the human face of uh, this uh, impact because most of the conversations we listen to we're talking of people who are affected in numbers but without really categorizing the impact on people uh, particularly those who are much more uh, uh, vulnerable coming to women you know the impact on women, I, th I think, is still going to be evaluated in future. It's very hard to say exactly what it means today because not only they lost their livelihoods, but they are the ones who have to provide for their families. And if they can't put the food on the table, you can imagine what it means to a mother to see her children, I mean, starving and without even going, having where to go. Second, health-wise, for instance, the lockdown meant that women could not go to clinics. And it means we went down in terms of the levels of antenatal programs which were in place. So the increase of unwanted pregnancies, it is still to be evaluated on women. Second, women are not yet being able to care for their own children. They can't take children to vaccinations, for instance. One of the examples is that uh, the, the, the Gavi had to postpone 14 programs of vaccinations. And this impacted women who are mothers who couldn't even take their children to uh, vaccination. And the emotional impact on this for mothers, it is not going to be told in numbers, but it is something which they will live with for the rest of their lives. But you asked also about uh, adolescents. You know, the adolescents, we decided to, my, my trust, in fact, we decided to organize uh, a listening series so that more than what we could imagine, we should listen to them, how the COVID is impacting on them. They, some of them, they told us they had to become, from one day to the other, they had to become adults, to care for families, to change completely, I mean, their daily activities because they were locked down with younger siblings and they had to organize their lives, et cetera. The inequality in terms of access to education. One, schools, all schools were closed, but some children could have online learning because they have at home the capacity to do so. But millions and millions of other children who are in poor families, in poor settings, particularly in rural areas, it means completely lost the whole academic year of 2020. And the implications of this, it's something which no one at this point can evaluate what it means, the loss of this opportunity for adolescents to have the education going on. We are told that about 10 million additional child marriages have been taking place during this period. You can imagine, because this is on top of those millions which were normally taking place, in one year only, we have much more 10 millions as, uh, as it is being said. We also have, as anyone else, the impact of gender-based violence. And I put it at the end because it goes, it's a gender, it's for women, but it's also for adolescents. And it's not yet something which we didn't have where to call and women had 
to stay in the house with their abusers. And of course, it means femicide also has increased exponentially on the continent during this year. So the impact of COVID, it's not only the numbers I'm talking about, it's the scars which are still in the hearts and the lives and in the souls of those who are being uh, in, in, in impacted and which I don't think we'll have the capacity to help them how to heal and how now to move on. So we still have to look at means and ways of more than the numbers to heal our society, to rebuild our re resilience, to be able to reform the way we are going to take up our lives again in the sense of bringing back sense of normalcy, but also some kind of the equalizing opportunities for everyone, particularly for women, adolescents, and children. Strive Masiwa, Grasa Mashal, Aliko Dangote, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us a little bit about what the continent is enduring and how the continent is dealing with this crisis. Thank you for your leadership as well in all of this. Asante Sana, thanks. And thank please take care of yourselves. You, Sending a virtual hug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Zane. Thank you. Very great and personal panel there. Well, few people have done more to support global public health than Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation co-chair Bill Gates. Up next, Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite gets Gates' take on how we can eliminate COVID-19 and move beyond this pandemic to start making plans to prevent and better respond to the next one. Bill Gates, thank you for talking again to the New Economy Forum and Bloomberg. We now have a couple of vaccines on the on the market with 90% effectiveness, supposedly. I wonder, from the point of view of people around the world, what's a reasonable timetable to expect going forward now? You know, what, when do we expect a reasonable number of people to be covered by this? Well, the mRNA vaccines, uh, which did such a great job of getting into trials quickly and now are being approved, uh, they are the hardest to scale up in volume and reduce in cost. But because mm -hmm. the results, the Pfizer antibody levels were about middle of the pack, it means that Novavax, Johnson & Johnson, and even AstraZeneca, which was slightly below, uh, are very likely to work. And those are vaccines that are low cost, uh, don't have the cold chain requirements. And we have Indian factories, second source factories that are by far higher volume than any Western vaccine factories, actually already making AstraZeneca and standing by to make Novavax and Johnson & Johnson. So if we can get those three uh, in addition to Pfizer and Moderna, then you can get into the billions of doses as you get towards summer 2021, and there won't the supply constraints won't be very bad. So it's very good news uh, that the efficacy of Pfizer was so high, uh, you know, and what that means for these other vaccines. And what do you think about the kind of politics of this? You you, you pointed out before that rich countries quite quite reasonably in some ways want to prioritize their own citizens, but there's a lot of people around the world, and I know you personally helped pay for these in some places, but when's, when, when will these reach out to the people of the poorer parts of the world? Well, normally you do some market mechanism and you know whoever's willing to yes. pay the highest price would be first in line. For uh, global health, that's really inappropriate. Now, of course, the rich countries that help fund the R&D, including the US through the BARDA efforts, uh, they will get some prioritization the only way to square this contradiction is to get the volume up. And that's why the high volume vaccine industry, you know, India makes $2 vaccines, the Western companies make $200 vaccines. The big volume, the big factories are over there. And for most of these types of vaccines, those companies, Serum, BioE, have the capacity. They don't for mRNA uh, vaccines uh, because of the, the lipid. So. It, 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 there will be some preference uh, into the rich countries because of these reservations that have taken place. 
But this novel second source thing that we funded through with several hundred million to those Indian companies, mm. uh, where they're literally making AstraZeneca vaccine right now uh, in higher volume than any other factory ever will, uh, that can get it so the developing world delay is like a four or five month delay, which will reduce the total deaths dramatically from this uh, for, if we had to force the developing countries to get to the back of the line. So you're going to have to see a process where, to begin with, it goes to the rich world, but by the, is it kind of by the begin, middle of next summer, say, that you're beginning to see the sort of penetration? Indian factories will send all of their output to developing countries. So India domestically, mm. and then Africa and other uh, low-income countries. So we have factories in the West it's never been done that a company, one company invented a vaccine and then other companies use their factories to manufacture that vaccine. Usually it has to essentially be reinvented uh, to get into another factory. And so that's what's so novel uh, and why we went and reserved that capacity uh, back in the spring, uh, you know, because the, the, that capacity is so gigantic and it can work uh, for these these constructs. Uh, you know, the world did not rehearse for this. If we had rehearsed, the idea of how we stitch together all this factory capacity would have been talked through, and there would have been a, a way of doing that, and the U.S. would have been part of that dialogue. As it was, all these second source agreements were done by the foundation paying out money and, and using the relationships and expertise we had with the Western companies and the Indian vaccine companies. Do you think there's a role for the public sector though? Do you think that the, the governments could come in and do more on this? Western well, governments? I saw you praise, you praised the British government actually on this. Well, the Strange. each government has had certain uh, mistakes and, Pluses and, and minuses. some things they've done well. In the case of the US, the only thing they've done well is they funded more R&D, not just for US-based companies, but for companies around the world, including a lot of these European constructs. And you know that was a good thing. That was a, a favor to the world. The rest of it, the US is sort of at the, the back of the pack, the diagnostic work we did, the messaging. You know, even today, the messaging is reaching a new level of incoherence. Just on that, I mean, very quick, quickly, I'm going to come back to vaccines, but you look at the numbers. I just looked again on the Bloomberg virus tracker. You look at the deaths for every million people. America is now close to 750 deaths. China, the other great participant in this conference, is around three deaths for every million people. Obviously, you know, one number may be a bit overcounted, the other bit undercounted, but by any measure, one country has done enormously better than the other. Why, 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 why do you, why has the U.S. been so bad compared with other people? I don't think comparing China and the U.S. is that helpful because the China has a a more authoritarian control over behavior uh, than mm. the U.S. Uh, does. But if you compare the U.S. to South Korea, Australia, the contrast is is every bit as dramatic as it is with China. And so we didn't catch the epidemic at that early stage where the numbers are small before they get exponentially big. And we are facing, which the, uh, the IHME model predicted, that the fall will be very tough. Some people didn't think the fall would be tough, but as they had looked at the numbers and saw in places like Brazil how the, the austral winter affected uh, infection rates, they saw that. And so the, you know, the bad news is the next six months in the Northern Hemisphere will be very tough. The good news is that both the vaccines and the therapeutics, in particular the antibodies, are coming along and will start to bring that number way down. But up to that point, presumably we must rely on masks and all these things that America has not been, and, and testing especially. That's right. The behavior <laughs> Uh, the using the test for people, and then if they test positive, uh, you contact Trace, and they those people make sure they're not infecting other people. Uh, the U.S. you know still has a long ways to go on on that. Uh, although the numbers are so extreme, you do have finally more uh, agreement 
that you know restaurants, bars, a number of things will have to forego during this next uh, five month period. Were you surprised by how, how badly America has done on that very quickly? Oh, it's mind blowing. We have so many more PCR machines than per capita than any other country. You know, we have the CDC that has the deep expertise and had practiced uh, how to communicate appropriately to the public. Uh, they made some mistakes early on, then they were completely muzzled. Nobody even knows the name of the, the people underneath, underneath Redfield who would have been the key communicators. And you know, we had this so-called task force. So it is disappointing. We don't get to go back and change that. Uh, but you know, we still have a chance to wear masks. In fact, that uh, at healthdata.org, that's the IHME forecast, they show a line that if you have good mask wearing, you know, that you save uh, now over 100,000 deaths in the US over the next uh, six months. Could, do you think this is, a, just getting back to the vaccines, do you think this is a disease that can actually be eliminated or is it one that ends up being controlled, it becomes endemic, a bit like the flu? And what does that mean in terms of supporting vaccination programs going ahead? That's a super good question. And we don't know enough yet to say, can we do the elimination of this? That would be the best because then uh, zero is magical because it, it just doesn't spread at all. It doesn't come back. Uh, I think there's a good chance we can do that, but we'll have to look at the vaccines, how good they are at blocking transmission. Because this is a super spreader disease, it is likely we can do that. Otherwise, we'll have to maintain immunity uh, on an indefinite basis, which probably means booster shots. And a little yeah. bit as people come into the country, it, do they have a digital certificate that says whether they've been vaccinated or not, which that's fairly complex uh, and will need for a period of time, you know, like we've tried to do with yellow fever. But uh, they, you know, as the US rejoins the WHO, this idea of what is the vaccine certificate look like, hopefully that dialogue uh, will will begin. You, you look at this this virus, coronavirus was tough, but it's possible you could have much worse viruses. And what, how, how should governments, you know, look at the world beyond, how should governments prepare? Should they have a system? Um, should they, should there be a certain amount of money that people put aside every year just, just to retain vaccine fighting um, so that if something worse comes along, we can deal with it. Yeah, so the, there's investments that are probably tens of billions a year for the rich countries that are both on the R&D side to get these platforms mm. so that the vaccine would come much faster, the antibodies would come much faster, and we can do testing not like a 1% to 2% uh, per week of a population, but more like 25% per week. So that we need R&D investments, but we also need several thousand people who are engaged in working on some chronic infection disease like malaria, polio, measles, who are who have the skill sets and are ready to switch over whenever a pandemic starts to emerge. And they need to be paired with a very strong surveillance capability, including in Asia and in Africa. So the cost won't be large compared to say the cost of the military. Uh, but people will expect governments, particularly the rich ones, to step up with those tens of billions of dollars. And, you know, I wrote a New England Journal of Medicine article back in 2015. Yeah. I'm a little smarter now about what those investments look like, but it's it's largely that plan. And it's, but, but in the way that a company should think about it, in order to incentivize companies to keep on doing this, is that the, the key bit? I remember years ago you telling me that the problem with vaccines is that you give them mainly to people who are well, and so there's always this big liability thing coming behind it. But is, if you look forward towards these more dangerous things, do you almost have a permanent monitoring force of companies who in the end are paid for in the same way as you might pay for defense? Well, we expect that the mRNA platform will solve the cold chain and the cost and scalability issues. And so that it uh, its speed of development which has proven to be the best, uh, is there for this next pandemic. And you'll have standby agreements 
for huge mRNA factory capacity to call on when this problem comes up. Likewise, uh, for antibodies and these test, these miracle testing machines that uh, we think actually come from testing seeds, we can get uh, a very high volume approach going. So we will be really a lot more ready because as you say, it could have been 10 times, 20 times more fatal. The only the bad thing was that it spread very effectively, but the death rate was fairly low and the difficulty to vaccinate turned out turned out to be quite uh, much better than we might have expected. How has it changed your your approach? How has it changed your mindset? You know, you you you're good at reacting to these sort of things. When you look at COVID, has it changed your how has it changed your view of the world? Has it changed your your view of the balance of power between the West and the East? Has it changed your your view of how the relationship between business and government should work? Well, how we orchestrate the private sector for what are they who have the skill sets for a problem that it's up to the government to be prepared for, that uh, we need to be smarter about that because it's the private sector innovation that's getting us the solutions, but it had to be government resources and coordination and regulatory well, approvals so that people think, okay, I, I do trust this vaccine and I'm willing to take it. Uh, you know, unfortunately the Chinese vaccines didn't find a high quality regulator and get that process going so that the WHO uh, could draw on those. That still may happen, but you know, it looks like it won't come on a, a timely basis relative to the, the Western vaccines. The, you know, I, my basic model of the world is that innovation can solve a lot of problems. And, you know, here with the, the you know, the idea of self-testing or the antibodies or the vaccine, you know, the bets we made as a foundation are uh, largely working out. And that's why we can see an end to this thing and a return to normalcy. So my bias towards innovation and, combining the government and, and private sector together, that's been deeply reinforced by this tragic pandemic. Just just to push you on that lastly, on, on the private, you know, you've been a great believer in the private sector and innovation. You look at this disease, you could say, isn't it amazing what the American private sector has done? You know, it has produced this vaccine. People, the drugs the companies have worked quicker than we've ever known. And yes, as I said earlier, you're, you know, America's heading to 250,000 deaths. And that is, it's like the private sector has worked and the public sector has not worked as well. Government has not worked as well. Has, that, has it changed your idea about the balance between the private sector and the public sector? Well, the role of the CDC can't be taken over by the private sector. The kind of messaging uh, and getting people you trust to be the ones telling you about masks and changing your behavior and so I don't, you know, we're just going to have to improve government. There are things government is absolutely necessary for, you know, R&D, yeah. uh, basic public health, including in Africa, uh, running really good primary health care systems. So, you know, we just need to give them better tools, better metrics, uh, and rehearse for the emergency. If we had rehearsed for this thing, we would have been so much uh, better off. We wasted those critical months particularly in the U.S., not having the testing and the messaging to avoid uh, getting to those very, very large numbers. And sadly, you know, that's true in a lot of, lot of Europe as well. Bill Gates, thank you very much for talking to us. Um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Conversation. And as we begin to wrap up our health day and move to our closing panel, we want to share with you a message from Dr. Tedris Adhanom Ghebreyesus. He's Director General of the World Health Organization. My friend Mike Bloomberg, Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, Thank you for the opportunity of sharing a few reflections with you today. COVID-19 is an unprecedented global crisis that has shaken the foundations of social, political, and economic security. The pandemic has exposed and exploited the gaps in our health systems and the inequalities of our societies. 
It has overwhelmed health systems in even the world's strongest economies. In some public debate, the response to the pandemic has been framed as a choice between health and the economy. But that's a false choice. We do not have to choose between lives and livelihoods. Many countries have demonstrated that with a comprehensive whole of government approach using evidence-based tools, widespread transmission of COVID-19 can be avoided or controlled and the economic damage can be limited. Far from a being choice between health and the economy, the pandemic has shown us that they are integrated and interdependent. When people are healthy, they can learn, earn, and innovate. When people are sick, the whole of society suffers. And when a pandemic hits, the entire foundation of economies can crumble. Consider this. The world spends 7.5 trillion US dollars on health each year, almost 10% of global GDP. We need to ask ourselves, are we getting value for money? WHO believes the answer is no. In recent years, Many countries have made huge investments and advances in medicine, but too many have neglected their basic public health systems, which are the bedrock for preventing, preparing for, detecting, and responding to outbreaks, and for promoting health and preventing illness of all types. Industrialized nations spend only between 2% and 4% of their health budgets on prevention. Countries spend billions treating lung cancer instead of stopping the scourge of tobacco, treating obesity, diabetes, and heart disease instead of promoting healthy diets, treating injuries instead of making roads safer treating depression instead of promoting mental health. WHO was established more than 70 years ago on the conviction that health is a fundamental human right, not a luxury for those who can afford it. That conviction remains at the core of everything we do, which is why universal health coverage is our top priority. The lack of access to affordable, Quality health care doesn't just have consequences for the health of individuals. It's also a break on social and economic development and a threat to global health security. It keeps people bogged down in poverty, saps productivity, and drains hope. Returning to the status quo is not an option. We don't just need more investment in public health. We must also rethink how we value health. The time has come for a new narrative that sees health not as a cost, but an investment that's the foundation of productive, resilient, and stable economies. To start building that narrative, WHO is establishing a new council on the economics of health for all to focus on the links between health and sustainable, inclusive, and innovation-led economic growth. The Council will comprise leading economists and health experts, and will be chaired by Professor Mariana Mazzucato, Professor of the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at the University of London and the founding director of the University's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Two lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic are clear. First, investing in strong health systems built on primary care is the defense against outbreaks and the economic shock that comes with them. Second, the fastest way out of this pandemic is for us to work together in solidarity across sectors and across borders.
cooperation and solidarity. In practice, that means that all our instruments to fight COVID-19, especially therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccines must be available on the basis of equitable and affordable access for all. Let me be clear, vaccines cannot only go to the wealthy in a few select countries. This is not just a moral imperative and a public health imperative. It's also an economic imperative. If we are to come out of this pandemic as quickly as possible and get back on the road towards a global recovery, then health workers, older people, and other at-risk groups must receive vaccines first. And in our interconnected world, if people in low- and middle-income countries miss out on vaccines, the virus will continue to spread and the economic recovery globally will be delayed. Equitable access is in the national interest of each and every country. Vaccine nationalism will prolong the pandemic, not shorten it. The pandemic has taken so much from us, but it has also given us something, the opportunity to think afresh about the world we want. We are all in this together. And together we can build the healthier, safer, and fairer world we all want. But for that, we need compassion, cooperation, solidarity to defeat the common enemy and build back better. Build back better. And the world will be better. And the world we all want. I thank you. And yes, we are all in this together. And now we've come to the last of our global voices. They are stories from people all over the world documenting the tragedies that this pandemic has inflicted on their lives. In this segment, we asked healthcare workers what they hope government and business leaders learn from this crisis and what they should change to better prepare for our future. Nursing staff, people in healthcare in general were afraid. My staff in particular, their mindset was is if we start taking these patients, we're gonna quit. We're gonna quit because we don't have adequate PPE to care for these patients. And although I didn't want anyone to quit, and I understood why, because these healthcare professionals, their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, um, their sons and daughters, and they have high-risk people that are very, very close to them. And when you don't know what you don't know at that time about COVID, you, there is some fear and there is some panic. So that was the greatest concern and probably the worst moment. और हम अपने लीडर सहबान को और अपने नेताओं को सरकार को जो बोल, बोलना चाहते हैं कि आशा वर्कर जो है महकमे की रीड की हड्डी है आगे लग के काम करती है ग्राउंड फ्लोर पे काम करती है तो वो आशा को अपना महकमे का अंग मान कर आप उसको तनखा लगाओ एंड द पेंडेमिक हैज जस्ट शोन अस हाउ स्टाफ आर रियली द they're just not well looked after. They're, they're expected to sacrifice themselves and then when they burn out, the people running hospitals just say next and they'll fill those shoes with somebody and they don't really care about their staff. So the staff who go into healthcare with all the best of intentions and the most noble um, ethics soon get sort of beaten down by that system where they're, they're, being, they're being compromised in what they can do. आशा को आपने आम लोगों के इलाज के लिए रखा है, 
तो आम लोगों को आशा वर्कर जो है हॉस्पिटल में लेके जाती है लेकिन वहां पर डॉक्टर नहीं होते हैं अगर डॉक्टर है तो उसके पास कोई सामान नहीं है अगर सामान है तो स्टाफ नहीं है स्टाफ है तो दवाइयां नहीं है इसलिए आम लोगों को सेहत सहूलत जो है ना के बराबर मिल रही है हमारे इंडिया में As we all talk about the healthcare system of the people, government and the leaders have to focus uh, to educate the people or make them aware of the consequences of the uh, pandemic. This virus is impartial. It affects the whole classes, both the poor and the rich. are the victims of this pandemic. This virus doesn't discriminate. This is not a blue virus. This is not a red virus. This is a global pandemic. Well, there's two things. One is people before profits. Because in most of the world, they have let profits dictate their decisions more than people. If I had a message to send to our world leaders about um how they should strengthen public health systems so that we're better prepared for the next pandemic. Um I would heavily encourage them to look at um the playbooks that were utilized um from state to state from this situation. You know, and I would encourage them to take a look at what supplies did we need the most and it wasn't just ventilators. It was oxygen, it was chest tubes, it was uh inhalers, right? Um because this was a respiratory virus, um when we were treating patients who had shortness of breath related to this virus, typically we would give a breathing treatment where well, we had to not do breathing treatments and we had to utilize inhalers so making sure that we have the appropriate amount of medication available for these kinds of things visiting with drug companies visiting with with uh, PPE companies visiting with all of our potential resources to make sure we have everything we need to be successful and some important things there to think about as we get into our final panel here at the 2020 Bloomberg New Economy Forum. We invite you as well to participate in a global town hall discussion moderated by Eurasia Group and G0 founder and president Ian Bremer. Now Ian will be joined by IMF managing director Kristalina Kristalina Gorgieva, also Alphabet and Google senior vice president and CFO Ruth Porat. and Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies founder Mike Bloomberg. We also want to hear your questions, so we implore you to send us your thoughts on Twitter using the hashtag our new economy. We also encourage our new economy forum delegates to submit questions. You can use the Q&A tab under your video player. And if you're watching on the Bloomberg send me your questions on IB, you can do that of course on the Bloomberg terminal. It has been a pleasure, my honor to be your host these past few days and I thank you for joining us. Be well and safe everyone. And right now I'm going to hand it over to Ian now for your new economy closing town hall. Ian. Thank you so much, Carol. Great to be with all of you. We're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about the global order in a post-COVID world. A few things we know. One, the good news, acceleration of innovation, not just in response to disease, the improvements in treatment of vaccines, but much more broadly across the global economy. The bad news, acceleration of disruption on the back of the people least capable capable of handling that stress, the workers that can't social distance, those who can't handle the schools being closed, whose jobs some of which aren't going to return. And then the deeply uncertain news the acceleration of geopolitical transition an absence of coordination and global leadership the united states announcing they're leaving the world health organization in the middle of a pandemic the united states and china becoming more oriented towards confrontation as we all heard from dr kissinger some turnaround as we look towards 2021 a turning point on the disease and the economic impact a turning point on the US presidency 
but also some very big structural forces in play that we're going to be dealing with some quite some time. So first, let me introduce Kristalina Gorgeyeva, Managing Director of the IMF. And, and Kristalina, so good to see you. Um, I want to start, we have the G20 meeting this weekend. We've not heard really at all from the G20 over the last year in response to coronavirus. What are you going to be asking other leaders to do to speed the economic recovery from COVID? Uh, great to see you, Ian. Uh, and uh, uh, let me go straight to what our message is to the G20 are. Uh, first, yes, we have some good news in terms of vaccines and a chance to overcome the health crisis, but we are not there yet. And in fact, a second wave of infections is slowing down the recovery. It is losing momentum. And in that context, our first message to leaders is do not withdraw support for the economy prematurely. Stay the course. In some countries, some of the measures that have helped to withstand the shock of this crisis are about to expire. And it is so important that we do not pull back until we see the health crisis in the rearview mirror. Uh, second, if we are to succeed to get out of this crisis in which we are all together, we have to stay together. And in that respect, working on accelerated delivery of vaccines to everyone everywhere is absolutely essential. We have calculated that if vaccines are delivered to people around the world in an accelerated manner, we will gain between now and 2025 nine trillion dollars and that helps with living standards especially in the developing world and three don't forget that we are losing growth as a result of this crisis we our trajectory has tilted downwards and we have another huge crisis looming on the horizon the climate crisis Synchronized action through a green investment push can lift up growth, generate jobs, and uh, it would be cheaper for everyone. And again, the fund being this disciplined number crunching organization, uh, we assess that we would get two thirds higher boost of growth with the same infrastructure push uh, if we do it in a synchronized manner. So a call for us to work together. And let me say one final word, word for the G20 to think of the world, world beyond the G20, especially poor countries. And there we would see success in uh, uh, that uh, suspension and a, a common framework to deal with that. But we have to do more. Uh, poor countries need help they need grants, they need concessional lending. At the fund, we have stepped up, and I expect to get a mandate to continue to do more for those that need help the most. The news that we've gotten on the vaccines in the past couple of weeks, is that changing significantly your and the IMF's outlook for how much you can do and where the world is going to be in 2021? Uh, our baseline projection for 2020 is minus 4.4 percent. We shrink for 2021 plus 5.2 percent with the assumption that by the middle of 21 we will have vaccines and that they will be deployed universally everywhere uh, within 18 months. So what we are seeing is a confirmation of this baseline projection. If vaccines actually become more widely available faster, that would lift global growth somewhat in uh, 21, but most importantly, would give us a boost in the following years. This being said, 
this boost on its own is not going to be enough to return the world on the growth trajectory from before the crisis. And this is why we are telling uh, uh, governments at a time when interest rates are so low and there is idle capacity, there are workers out of work and capital chasing investment opportunities, this is the time for high quality uh, infrastructure investments. Uh, they would help us to create a faster catch up, but also they eliminate obstacles to private sector to invest uh, from di digital infrastructure to green mobility. Uh, these are investments that have a uh, high multiplier and it is now the time to make them. You can't talk about 2021 without climate in pretty much any conversation right now. Quick answer from you, Kristalina. What's the thing you most expect to see in 2021 that will make a difference in our trajectory on climate? Uh, I expect countries to anchor their economic development into net zero commitments and on that basis to step up uh, public investment, use their uh, stimulus for green investments. I expect to see more countries adopting carbon price, which is a huge incentive to transform uh, the trajectory for businesses and, uh, and for governments. And I expect more attention to, uh, to just transition, to helping those that are affected by a transformation to low carbon climate resilient development uh, to be paid more attention because otherwise we would not have the public support for what is so essential to do. 2021 can be a transformative year. Thank you so much, Kristalina. We'll be back in just a moment. First, we're going to hear from McKinsey managing partner Kevin Sneeder on why health is so important to restoring the global economic recovery and growth. Until the pandemic, economists focused on healthcare costs rather than the economic benefits of good health. A year-long study by the McKinsey Global Institute suggests that that was a mistake. Poor health before the pandemic reduced GDP by about 15 per cent. To put that in perspective, that's twice the expected impact of COVID-19 this year. And the costs of poor health were driven by young people, by people dying too young, by conditions that took them out of the workforce and made them socially and economically isolated. So there's a real opportunity and actually a need to rethink healthcare as an investment, one that reduces disease burden by as much as 40% by 2040, from interventions that largely exist today and that can in turn bring rewards in terms of global growth. Think about what the opportunity looks like. The average 65-year-old could be as healthy as a 55-year-old today. Infant mortality could decline by as much as 40%. 240 million more people could indeed be alive by 2040. And that could all be achieved largely on the back of things we actually have available to us now, as opposed to things we hope to achieve in the future. The economic payoff could be huge, up to $12 trillion more in GDP. That's the same as China's economy in 2017. Investing in healthcare produces a high return. Every dollar adds two to four dollars. And that's largely through interventions such as rethinking labor and employment to encourage worker participation by older workers, by improving workspaces and introducing flexible retirement policies, by promoting healthier communities and environments, including investments in clean water, sanitation and nutrition, rethinking healthcare systems, by focusing on lifestyle related conditions and making maximum use of digital technologies that are now available to us. Doubling down on innovation, for example, in therapeutics and in healthcare delivery. The majority of what I've just discussed would cost less than $100 for every additional life year. Our research shows that 70% of actions to improve healthcare happen before patients seek care. Half comes from living in healthier environments. So improving healthcare has a potential to be not just an improvement from an economic point of view, but it can also be a social game changer. Few investments can offer the same returns 
in terms of social needs and boost to the economy. Longer term prevention and healthcare and promotion cannot just be left to healthcare providers or systems, however. It really does fall to being everybody's business, and it's plain good business at that. Thanks so much, Kevin, from his apartment in Hong Kong. We get to see everybody's backdrops right now. Now to Ruth Parad in Palo Alto um, from Google. And Ruth, let me ask, it's great to see you. Uh, you know, we've seen that coronavirus has shown us just how extraordinary technology companies have been in enabling the global economy to just keep going. Thank God. We're also seeing really stark inequalities in the United States and around the world. So let me start by asking you, what do you think the role and the responsibilities are for the tech sector and for Google in helping to reverse these inequalities? Oh, you're absolutely correct that what we're seeing as a result of COVID is an acceleration in this digital transformation. And you see it in so many different areas, commerce, education, telehealth. But absolutely, we're very concerned about what we're also seeing, which is a greater spotlight on the cracks in our social system in education, in jobs, healthcare. Um, and as we look at it and have for quite some time, one of the most important points and drivers for us is that you can't have a healthy, durable economy if, it, if everyone doesn't have the opportunity to participate. And so years ago, as we were looking at a digital transformation that wasn't going at quite this pace, but the direction of travel was clear, we launched a Grow with Google program, which is a digital skills program for individuals, NGOs, and small and medium-sized businesses. And what we learned pre-COVID, for example, working with small, medium-sized businesses, is as they transitioned to digital skills, they saw an uplift in revenues and profitability. What we saw post-COVID is one in three small, medium-sized businesses said without digital skills, they would have failed. So what went from being an uplift became a lifeline. And we're redoubling our efforts on digital skills training. But I think very importantly, what we also have learned in this journey is when we began working with individuals, it was very much a one-to-one -one training program. And over the years, what we concluded is what would be most potent is to work cross company, cross industry, and create basically certificates that would enable individuals to have transferable skills. We focused in particular on IT, an IT certificate program. It was one of the fastest growing uh, job categories. Created a, an IT certificate program. In eight months, you could earn one of, these program, one of these certificates and built a consortium of companies, including Walmart, Bank of America, Intel, Hulu, and others, so that once you earn this, it's basically a light degree and you can go where you, where, where you find a role. And for us, one of the very important things is each of us has a responsibility to address these issues in society. I think our view is if we come together and work cross company, and ideally, even through public-private partnerships, we can magnify the impact that we have. So we're very focused on Grow with Google. You're going to continue to see more of our efforts there. It moved from physical space to virtual as a result of COVID. And, and you, you heard Kristalina say, look, we need the G20 not only to do no harm, but also to come together, that the countries know what needs to be done, but they need to coordinate. Are, are, you're saying the same thing for the private sector. Are you finding that that challenge is more of a lift? I mean, both within your sector, companies that historically have viewed each other as very tough competitors, as well as across sectors where you don't necessarily have the connectivity? No, I think what we're each seeing is single point solutions are important. But to the extent we can come together and look at, as we do, for example, with our IT certificate at cross industry solutions, we can have a bigger impact. And to the extent we can work in conjunction with cities or with the federal government, even more so. So, for example, one, you know, one of the programs um, that many of the programs that we've developed, we've developed with cities to identify what some of their needs are. And we've said, for example, in the area of climate change, cities came to us and one of the questions they had was, what's their, what's their carbon footprint? So we've created a tool working with cities to address, um, help them identify what is their carbon footprint from the built environment and from transit. There are areas like that where, again, hearing from cities and doing public-private partnerships uh, is substantially more potent. I would say in the area of COVID, one of the first things that we heard from cities was they wanted to understand what was going on with those social distancing and were their programs actually working. And so we created a tool that was called social mobility, downloaded millions of times, that aggregated data, and it was anonymous data, but allowed cities to understand 
were their programs in fact working? And it's these kinds of efforts where you can leverage the, the technology with the clear needs from cities, federal government, or other companies to magnify your impact. And tell us, as we're talking about climate, tell us a little bit about where you think the biggest breakthroughs are going to be through artificial intelligence in helping us to create radical new efficiencies that will allow us all to think about the climate challenge very differently. So we're already applying AI to climate change in a number of areas. I think one that I'm particularly excited about is that we believe we have the most um, efficient data centers globally. And yet we challenged ourselves to say, how with AI can we improve energy consumption in our data centers? And we, in fact, lowered energy consumption by 30%. That's starting from a base that we already thought was strong. And so we've now opened this technology to, and the learnings that we've had to others to say, how can you similarly apply AI to enhance your energy consumption. We're also using AI in areas, for example, in flood prediction. 250 million people around the globe are affected by floods as a result of climate change. And any any information that will give you even a bit of an early lead on you know, direction of flooding can save lives. And so it's everything from what's going on with crops to what's going on with flooding to how do you run your business. And we're continuing to look at ways that AI can improve both efficiency and help save lives. An unfair question to you, Ruth. I mean, because over the last years, whenever we see the climate scientists, the more we learn, we ter it turns out it's a lot worse than we thought it was. Do you think that there's going to be a reverse process there, that the more we learn about AI, the more robust our capacity to actually turn all of this back in terms of climate? So um, AI will have its place in helping with technology solutions, as I've already described, I think one of the most important elements as we're turning um, to the topic of climate change is what does each one of us individually do? And do we have uh, federal and global policies that are supportive of technology innovation and other efforts that each one of us is taking? It's core to what we're doing at Google. Thank you so much, Ruth. And now we're right on time uh, for Mike Bloomberg, who, of course, everybody knows. Uh, thanks for organizing all of this, Mike. And maybe let me start with you by trying to connect uh, the conversations that we've just had uh, with Ruth, Kristalina, and Kevin, because you've been one of the biggest believers globally in public-private partnerships. So in your mind, what do you see as the best ingredients that are going to allow us to bring the public sector and the private sector together to address these issues? Well, uh, I guess I'm of the view that the uh, public sector talks about it, but it's the private sector that's actually making a difference. If you see what happened in the last three decades, we have cut global poverty in half. If you measure it by a roof over your head, uh, a meal in your stomach, and being literate. And unfortunately, because the recent government in the United States, but also around the world, the anti-globalization is cutting back on the opportunities for people around the world who participated during all of the globalization. Now they're getting the short end of the stick, and we're not doing anything about it. Uh, there was an earthquake in Haiti, as I remember, and the world came together and promised $10 billion in aid overnight. And I think something like 250 million actually showed up. So you've got to be very careful here and not listen to what the politicians say, but how people react. We've got to do something about our climate. Climate change is going to kill us all. Well, one of the things we can do is get investors and employees and customers of companies to behave more responsibly in all ESG issues. And that's why in the United States, we've closed 60% of all of the coal-fired power plants in the last half a dozen years. And we continue, we'll be out of coal in the United States by the end of 2030. Forget about 2050. If we're waiting for things to be delivered in 2050, we're not going to be around to see them. It just th look at the storms, look at the uh, uh, forest fires, uh, look, look at the pollution in the air and the cancer rates and uh, asthma rates. Uh, things are not going in a good direction, but we've got to fight climate change. Then we've got to do something about education. The world's becoming much more complex. 
We need better education if we're going to have jobs. And we talk about AI, and AI is wonderful. For our company, it helps us, our customers, identify trends in financial markets and things like that. And Ruth's company can use it to reduce energy consumption. But AI also has the potential to destroy an enormous number of jobs. And how we're going to deal with that, I'm not sure. There's no easy answers. But these are the things that we've got to go and focus on rather than just talking about it. So we haven't talked much about the United States yet, but of course, you know, you ran the biggest city uh, in the country and uh, you also ran for president. We're uh, about to see a transition of power and a massive amount of stimulus is needed uh, to respond precisely to the problems that you just raised. Um, what do you think specifically? We know how tough the lift is going to be, especially if it's divided government. What do we need to see in terms of the municipalities, in terms of New York City? What happens if we don't see it? Well, we have to have leadership. I don't think there's, the, the U.S. government can't possibly come up with enough cash, no matter how much they borrow, to solve all of the damage that the virus has done to our economies around the world. Somehow or other, we've got to get through this and have people get confidence again and start going out and shopping and uh, enjoying themselves and giving the, all the different groups that work in our society uh, the opportunity to get back to work. And we so far haven't done that. We, maybe you have to have the vaccine first, and that's coming along. But I think it's unrealistic to think that you'll have a large pop percentage of the population uh, taking a vaccine in anything less than, let's say, the next 12 months. It just takes a lot of time, and it's not clear how many people are willing to take it at the beginning and, and how effective it's going to be in the long term. There may be tail events that uh, you don't know about now when the vaccine hasn't been able to be tested to see whether it prevents those as well. So we've got to go and understand that we've a lot of people have died, an outrageous number. If we had behaved better, we could have saved enormous number of lives. But also, we've damaged our economy and we've damaged our education system so that we've got a whole bunch of kids who are just about to miss a whole year of school in a world where they need more years than what we've been giving them, not less. And so it, it's time to stop, back, sit back and say, this is going to be with us for a while and we're going to have to pull together and we're going to have to rebuild uh, cities not just with finance, but with people's confidence. And in the end, get people back to work. Because if they're spread out around, I know distance learning sounds fine, but there is no substitute for being together where we share ideas, where we create, uh, where we talk to each other to find out what we need. And you just can't do that remotely. It's become fashionable to say that you can, but I do not believe that that's going to happen. There's a reason why big cities are big. It's because it's where culture is and where commerce is and where opportunity is. And, and that, that issue of schooling right now, very real, very live, very passionate right here in New York City. No, no question, Mike. Before we turn to the broader panel, uh, let me ask you uh, a version of the big question I asked Crystal at the beginning, which is what are the big lessons that you take now that we've, we've had a year of this coronavirus for how the world does and does not respond to climate? Well, first thing is that leadership matters. And when you have a leader that denies science, it just percolates through the economy and people believe it. You got to remember, Donald Trump got 70 odd million votes. This is a, a, after saying that he should drink Lysol, uh, that uh, this is all a hoax, that the people who are talking about it don't know what they're talking about, no matter how much science they've studied in the, in, in the past. Leadership matters. And then we're all in this together. I don't think that we should tell you how to leave your life unless by doing so you're hurting somebody else. So I don't care whether you wear a mask if it was the only thing keeping you safe. If you want to run the risk with your life, if you want to smoke, for example, go ahead and smoke. 
but you don't have a right to smoke and let force other people to breathe the smoke that comes out of your cigarette, just as you don't have a right to breathe germs on other people where they're going to suffer. So a law that says we all have to wear masks when we're together, I support. One that says that uh, you have to wear a mask when you're by yourself, no, if that's if you're if, if you want to act stupidly and take your own life, that's your decision. We're not trying to take away people's freedoms, and unfortunately, the dialogue has become that that's what we are trying to do is to hurt other people, and we're not. We're trying to protect all of us, including ourselves. So thank you so much, Mike. And now we're going to open it back to the panel. We've got a lot of questions that have been coming through uh, via social media. And the first one that I see relates directly to an issue, Mike, you were just addressing. Susan Moore via Twitter asks, how can we gain the trust of people who are skeptical of a COVID-19 vaccine? And what are your thoughts on making such a vaccine mandatory? Given what you just said about masks and smoking and the rest, Mike, let me turn to you on that first. Uh, well, I think the courts would not allow it to be mandatory in the United States. In China, uh, for all I know, I think that they do require a lot of people to take a vaccine. We have a very different system in America, and I can only speak to that. I think the ways you get people to do it is slowly have people take it and show that they are living longer, have fewer cases of the uh, virus, and um, it didn't uh, hurt them at all. You have to do it by example, and slowly over time, each day, a few more people will take it and a few more people will take it. You will get to the point where the anti-vaxxers uh, just aren't going to take it, and they will suffer. Um, I, I can't, it, it, it defies explanation why somebody walks away from all of the medicine and all the science but you will get a vast majority of the people as long as you do it slowly. And we don't have leaders who are out there uh, speaking falsehoods and trying to excite people uh, to, to do stupid things. And the other piece of this, uh, it goes squarely to the tech sector and Ruth, because, I mean, at least, you know, on the vaccines, we're going to see the Democratic and Republican parties all saying this is a good idea. Let's take it. It won't be politicized. But there's a level of absolutely crazy disinformation that continues to explode in the media and in social media that says, oh, my God, no, Bill Gates is trying to put a chip in your head. Uh, what, what can Google do, what can the tech sector do to try to ensure that we actually really reduce this anti-vax movement and get this to the people so we can get back to normal, get back to our lives as quickly as humanly possible? So disinformation, sadly, is not new, and we've invested meaningfully in both people and machine learning to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to elevate authoritative information as it relates to, for example, covid we were anchored and very tightly partnered with the World Health Organization, and we continue to do that. But I think Mike made a very important point. One of the first things we did at Google is aggregate this quality information around COVID and put up some pretty obvious points like wear a mask, socially distance. And yet there was a campaign going the other way. And unless we have clarity in our public policy statements, it's going to be hard to break through. So we are doing a lot of work around uh, disinformation to try and make sure we're elevating authoritative information. But again, that public policy point, I'll just commend Mike on one very important element related to COVID. One of the things that we were excited about at Google is we partnered with Apple to come up with a, a, an app around contact tracing, exposure notification, one of the other very valuable tools to try and slow down the pace of this ghastly disease. Mike was um, super helpful ensuring that we get this implemented in New York and then expanded to the tri-state area. But exposure notification, contact tracing, can't be effective if there's not massive um, take up of it because it's really about what happens as you travel throughout the day. And so again, we need public policy consistency around these statements and then we can amplify with technology and some of the solutions that we have. Thank you very much, Ruth. And so let, now a question for you, Kristalina, from Tim Ramsey. He asks, when will debt burdens around the world begin to bite and constrain our ability to make strategic investments. I mean, certainly one of the big stories we haven't talked yet about is the fact that, you know, debt around the world is only going to increase. Interest rates right now are low, probably not forever. How do you think about that from the IMF perspective? 
But the, in some countries, uh, that burdens are already crushing uh, businesses and economies. Uh, what we are seeing around the world is indeed, uh, we started this crisis with high levels of debt, and not surprisingly, uh, we have seen an increase everywhere. Uh, in advanced economies, um, uh, public borrowing, government debt, has gone up by 20% to GDP. Now it is at 125% of GDP almost. In uh, emerging em uh, markets, um, debt levels have gone up uh, to around 65%, an increase of about 10, almost 10%. And in poor countries, debt levels have gone up uh, to around now 50% of GDP. It is in poor countries and countries that have stepped into this crisis already with unsustainable debt levels, that we do need to take action today. Uh, we have seen uh, two debt restructurings, Ecuador and Argentina. Uh, we, you see in the press uh, discussions around Zambia. And there are other countries where this is an issue that is pressing uh, today. And I want to uh, flag that there is also, of course, corporate debt. Uh, right now, the corporates are being helped with policy support, and everybody is being helped with low interest rates uh, in most countries. But as this policy support gradually is reshaped and uh, we exit the health crisis, it is withdrawn, uh, there would be uh, uh, pressing debt issues to be, uh, to be sorted out. So what is the IMF doing? We are doing three things. One, we have lobbied hard for uh, debt service suspension for the poorest countries. 44 of them have taken advantage of this. So as their economies are in standstill, their debt service is in standstill. Two, we ourselves, for our poorest members, provided debt relief. 29 of the countries that have so debt obligations to the IMF do not service until April. Uh, they actually would not service it ever. It is, it is relieved. But the third part is most important. We work with countries on a case-by-case -case basis to establish how we can bring debt down to a sustainable level. And we work with countries to have good regimes for uh, dealing with bankruptcies. Uh, so there can be a credible, prudent exit without harming the broader economy. Uh, and I can say in conclusion that uh, this topic is going to be uh, with us. Yes, interest rates are low, but when you take debt, eventually it has to be paid uh, back. Best way to do that, the economy grows, our debt service capacity uh, improves, and that we need to uh, uh, zero uh, on. Mike, I have to bring this question to the United States, because I have to assume that with a Democratic president administration coming in, Republicans are suddenly going to be much more interested in deficit reduction again. Um, given what's needed in the United States, uh, how, what is your view on, on U.S. debt broadly and how you think an American administration, the Biden administration, should go about addressing that question? Well, everybody's a debt hawk when they're out of office. Uh, when they're in office, they want to give the voters as many goodies as they can so they can stay in office. And uh, the Republicans will now go from being a prolific party to a party that is worried about the deficit. Uh, we're going to have to deal with this. I think it's inconceivable that we could pay this down in any meaningful percentage of time. We will keep rolling it over. We'll learn to live with it. And as long as America has the currency that the whole world depends on, it's okay. If, however, China's currency, for example, becomes more important than America's, then we've got a very big problem. And I don't know that any one administration, the Biden administration, or whoever comes four or eight years later, is going to have any unique solutions to do something here. What we've got to do is get the economy going back again and have companies generate uh, revenue and pay taxes and individuals pay taxes and then stop expanding the expenditures all the time. Cities keep growing faster in their infrastructure 
or in, in the number of people that work for them than in the number of people paying taxes. And that's just unsustainable. And you look at New York, a lot of wealthy people are moving to lower tax states. If you look at industry around the country, a lot of companies are moving to right to work states. Um, they're trying to do what's right for themselves. And each state is trying to compete with each other for the combination that will be the best for their citizens. New York is a high tax state. But I would argue, I live here and plan to live here for the rest of my life, I get good value for the taxes that I pay. I live in the most wonderful city in the world, is the way I think, and I'm glad my family is here. But not everybody does that. Everybody's in competition from one state to another for our companies and for our citizens. And then America is in competition with countries all around the world for who's going to make the products. Right now, America buys its chips now more and more from China. We cannot, we're, we're not self sufficient anymore. Uh, as, you, know, you do see companies like Google and Microsoft starting to make their own, Apple's now making their own, just because the American industry stopped making them. We outsource this stuff, but nobody wants to be dependent on somebody else. So we're going to have to rethink an awful lot of what we do here and how we deal with an emerging superpower we, from World War I to today, with the superpower of the world. We are not going to be the only superpower. It's going to be us and China. And the new economy form, uh, absolutely putting that first and foremost, how we all address that. So we, we've talked a little bit about how intrusive governments should be in the lives of people. Uh, and, and you remember back, I mean, Mike uh, telling us as mayor that we can't have our 64 ounce uh, Coca-Cola uh, in, in the stores. Um, a question here for Ruth from Michael Boyle on the corporate uh, side of this. Michael asks, should companies mandate programs that incentivize employees to maintain physical health? We're seeing so many coronavirus in cases in people with preventable pre-existing condition conditions. Should the private sector lead the way to improve health? Ruth. I think I would answer it the same way Mike answered the question. Mandating um, tends to, I don't, I don't see mandating. I do see providing quality information so people can make the right choices. So at Google, we spent a lot of time on wellness and we've done a lot around hygiene. We're looking forward to bringing people back to the office as soon as we we can, and a lot of the, the, the protocol around bringing people back to work is going to be what about social distancing? How do you reformat your footprint so that you can bring people back into the office safely? What are we going to maybe need to do with masks? But I, I wouldn't go to mandating. I think provide quality information, provide it on a consistent basis, and uh, hope and hope that people make the right choices. And I will just add to Mike's point about New York City. We similarly are very bullish New York City. We just had another milestone in building out our campus and do look forward to bringing people back into the office in New York City as well. So no mandates for either, but nudging, a lot of nudging in public policy, both in the governmental sector, uh, in the corporate sector, and even in the G20. Uh, two questions here that are basically the same question, one from the Mandela Institute and one from Bin Cheng Mao. And they're both asking how the global community can come together to ensure that people are not left behind in terms of vaccines in terms of health care protections. We know about COVAX, but we also know, of course, the United States has been driving so much of the investment and the wealthy countries are going to be taken care of first. What do we do to respond to that? This is really a question first and foremost to Kristalina. Uh, I am so grateful that uh, uh, we are asked this question because uh, what I can say with strong conviction is vaccine policy is an economic policy. If we do not pursue access to vaccines and improvements in health systems everywhere, we cannot get to a point of robust recovery. Uh, and it is therefore an enlightened self-interest that should drive us to work together towards uh, the promotion of access to vaccines. Uh, we have seen uh, many leaders stepping up. Uh, it was uh, so rewarding uh, that uh, uh, the uh, Europeans, um, Australia, uh, the many uh, emerging markets came together and said, we want 
to be sure that vaccination is not going to be rich countries, rich people luxury, because if it is only for them, it's just not going to work. Uh, so what, what can we do? We can, of course, uh, as, uh, as global community, press on that point and uh, uh, do our own, in our own responsibility, uh, all we can to make that case. Uh, and I can tell you, in my role, uh, we are an organization of 190 members. Uh, we are pressing this message that, that health and economy are two sides of the same coin uh, and that we are so interdependent. If, if this crisis taught us something, it is we depend on each other. Uh, and actually taught us one more thing, uh, if I may. Ian, can I add one more yeah, point? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can add one more point. What the hell? Thank you. Uh, and the point is, this also, the crisis also taught us, very simple, prevention is better than cure. Uh, remember the global financial crisis? After the global financial crisis, we built stronger banking system. It is more resilient. And so my dream is from this crisis to expand this concept of resilience. Resilient people, uh, Mike talked about education, educated, healthy, everybody having access to health services. Uh, uh, resilient planet, we make sure that we don't blow up the future of our children with irresponsible, uh, high carbon, low, low resilience uh, uh, actions. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, resilience of how we come together as community, respect, depend on each other. So let me, last question uh, from uh, the, uh, from social media it comes from uh, Talon Richards. And, and I like, well, yeah, well, that's actually, that's a really good one that just came in. I'm going to save that to the end. I'm going to do one quick one. Bonnie Lumley asks, what can key lessons can Western East and countries learn from each other when it comes to public and private sector responses to the pandemic. I'm so interested in the question I asked to Mike about vaccines. And of course, yeah, the Chinese response is completely different. And indeed, the Chinese response to coronavirus is completely different. Do you that Mike, I want to ask you, what do you think that there are interesting things that the Americans and the West can and should learn from China in terms of the way that we've seen the response to coronavirus play out? Yeah. Well, I think the message is that if everybody gets together and does the right thing, we can conquer a virus. The question is, do we want to have the government tell us what to do? And in America, we basically don't. So we're suffering from more fatalities and more pain and suffering because we're leaving it up to people to make their own decisions. In China, they have a form of government where the government decides, and I don't want to overstate it, but the government decides what's right for their people, and then people fall in line, and in fact, the Chinese laws in many cases make them do it. But I'm more optimistic. If the virus really works, and if you have a number of different manufacturers, think about the it, vaccine. there's uh, seven and a half billion people on the planet. If you could have a vaccine for, let's say, $2 a person, that, that's not that much money compared to what we're coming up with money to help corporations and small businesses and that sort of thing. And that's just in America. You could really give a virus to not everybody because everybody wouldn't take it. And I'm not sure we could get it to everybody, but enough so that the virus would then die out. And I think the real question is, what are we going to do to get ready for the next time there's a virus? Because we now live in a world where people fly around and ship goods all over the world. And it's much easier for a virus to spread than ever before. If you go back and see what lessons did we learn from the 1918 Spanish flu, which had nothing to do with Spain, but 1918, 1919, even into 1920, something like 25% of the world's population died from the flu. What did we learn? We learned social distancing and masks. And if you look mm -hmm. at pictures of sporting events from those days, everybody in the audience wore a mask. If you look at pictures of hospitals, they had beds outside spaced apart. And up until this vaccine, that's all we have done in all those years. We never learned more. I don't know what the right answer is, 
but we didn't really focus on it. We never thought about this happening. And although, in all fairness, I think Bill Gates did predict something like this. But we just got to go and think about the next thing while we're solving this thing. No, and, and, and you're right, though. Of course, I mean, one thing that's extraordinary is just how quickly, the, from, from not knowing a disease, we now have uh, what looks to be several vaccines that are going to be incredibly effective in rolling it out. Unprecedented. No, nobody thought that, that you could do something this quickly. And there's at least three right away. And there's probably 20 other companies working on vaccines that may be even better. And incidentally, just to take away a little bit from the excitement, we don't really know how long the protection will uh, last or how effective it will be or whether people who will, will come down with other things at the same time that this vaccine does not prevent. So uh, we got to keep working and keep uh, uh, depending on science and understand that science changes. And that's one of the things that makes it so difficult. People say, oh, the doctors and the scientists said this six months ago and now they're changing. Yes, as we learn, you change. And an intelligent person would always accept the change as we learn and unfortunately, some people find that to mean that they didn't know what they were talking about. We said, oh, we have a theory. Oh, well, it's just a theory. No, gravity is a theory. You drop something, it falls down. Newton said that. And Newton was right unless you looked at the speed of light, in which case he was wrong. And so none of these things are what you think they are. Nothing's going to be that quick. Um, we're going in the right direction. But we have a lot of pain and suffering that we're going to have to get through before we get there. And I hope Ruth is right that companies will follow Google, get their people back to work, because not only it will I believe it's good for the companies, I think that it is much better to have people together, but we have an obligation to those other companies that service our companies. So we have an office where our employees are, but we have an obligation to help all the small businesses around our building who are depending on our employees to buy their food, to have their shoes fixed in their store, uh, to, to, to go and, 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 and drink in their bars, whatever it is. We're not just in this alone, and I don't think companies should just worry about their own P&L. I think they have an obligation to help their city and their country and their neighborhood. And one of the ways to really do that is to get the big cities back and going again, because without that, we don't have a civilization and we don't have an economy. And Mike, thank you very much. And, you know, the last question that I was going to ask uh, was about what we're optimistic about in the next few months. And I think we've heard that. Um, already from the panel that we're finally at a point that we can not only see light at the end of the tunnel, but we actually know how long the rest of the tunnel is. Um, and th and that, that gives us so much more capacity uh, to just keep soldiering forward. So, you know, with that, I'd really like to offer my thanks uh, for a very successful closing town hall and, and also the new economy forum, Kristalina Gorgeva of the IMF, Ruth Porat at Google Alphabet, and of course, Mike Bloomberg, Thanks so much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. And, and now uh, let me uh, bring in uh, Andy Brown, the editorial director of the New Economy Forum, to close this year's program and also preview 2021 in Beijing. It's funny, Andy, looking at you like this, it's almost like there's just been the sports match, you know, and now we're doing a little color commentary afterwards. I mean, I have the questions I'm supposed to ask you, which, of course, I now want to go completely off piece. So what did you see there, Andy? How did it go? How did the game how did the game go? Well, look, first of all, Ian, thanks. Thanks for moderating an incredible town hall. I mean, you know, if I if I look back um, over four days of live broadcast public debate, hours and hours of smaller backstage sort of more intimate off the record conversations i think really that the, the thing that jumps out at me is despite the fact that we live in this incredibly divided world and you've written about this the us and them well there's actually a remarkable consensus about the nature of the big problems that we face and and you know a a, a 
understanding about you know, the broad approach to, to solving these, these problems. Overwhelming consensus, first of all, that we need a green recovery, that we can't make the same mistake that we made last time, and double down on investments in, in polluting uh, carbon-heavy industries. Um, I, I think... You know, the, the interesting thing is listening to the to the to the business community who are getting around, who are getting behind this this idea of a green recovery, not just as a moral imperative, which of course it is, uh, but also um, a business opportunity. You know, and and you heard Larry Fink saying that climate risk is investment risk, and Carlos Brito saying, you know, what's good for the uh, uh, for the environment is 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 also good for business. I think overwhelming consensus that we're facing a crisis in the real economy, not the financial economy and that the tools that worked last time around aren't going to work this time around. Central banks don't have the answers. The financial system, at least as it's currently configured as a platform for trading financial instruments rather than funneling money to small, medium-sized enterprises, um, that's not going to work this time. And what we need is, is more targeted fiscal measures, uh, but also smarter and more digital tools uh, to get funding to the real economy. And as, as, as Ajay Banga uh, was reminding us, the necessity to get it to uh, woman-run business is probably the largest, greatest single untapped source of dynamism in the global economy. And, and finally, I guess this you know, overwhelming consensus that we have to invest more in, in public health, that it's just crazy that the World Health Organization is funded like a hospital system in a small U.S. state and for the, for the want of a, a few billion dollars of, of, of funding for research into vaccines, into therapies, into stockpiling. You know, we have uh, 1.35 million deaths around the world and, you know, trillions of dollars of damage to the, to the global economy. No, indeed. I mean, the politicization of the WHO um, by uh, the Trump administration um, in the middle of all this and given how weak uh, and how limited their resources are was probably, for me, the low point in terms of global governance, exactly the opposite of what you wanted to see. Of course, now we are heading into a Biden administration, and I'm interested, given uh, the business and government leaders that we had participating from China, what did you hear specifically about their expectations? I mean, so much, the, the conventional wisdom in the United States is Trump or Biden, you know, actually, it's just going to be a more hawkish orientation towards China. Are they a little bit more optimistic than that? Well, we heard two days ago from one of China's top financial regulators, Fang Xinghai. And, you know, his message to America was basically... Um, you know, we want better relations, uh, we are opening up, uh, the United States should be more patient, uh, and that we're, yes, we're talking about self-reliance, but it doesn't mean that we're cutting ourselves off from the world. What it does mean is that we want to be less vulnerable on key technologies so that uh, we don't get blackmailed. If you, you know, we talking to our Chinese community, um, you know, in, in some of the, in some of our, our smaller closed door sessions, it's pretty clear that nobody is expecting a Biden presidency to usher in a new era of Sino-American uh, friendship. Uh, far from it. Um, I think there's a, I think there's a, a pretty grim realization that the underlying problems haven't gone away and that China is not going to fundamentally change and the Biden administration is not going to dismantle all the measures that the Trump administration put in place, the financial sanctions, the, the, the trade tariffs, the investment restrictions. And, you know, the, the, I, I guess what they're hoping, perhaps more than expecting, uh, is that these two countries can figure out a way to um, both compete and to cooperate. And, you know, what would those areas of cooperation be? And, and the obvious ones are around public health, uh, around climate, and to a lesser extent, I guess, you know, collaboration on financial stability. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, no, it, it is, it's an enormous problem in the two largest countries in the world that have so little trust for each other um, and also have created so many red lines and saying we have to, you have to adapt to us. No, we're not going to. When in reality, both countries are going to have to learn to cohabitate. And that's why I brought up Dr. Kissinger's uh, keynote, because, of course, you know, he has a lot of experience in how difficult it is when when countries don't do that. 
Um, so what, what, what do you think, I mean, given that, what do you think uh, the uh, new economy forum looks like next year? I mean, it's not going to be virtual, right, which is a great thing. But leaving that aside, uh, how, how do you think it's going to be different? What do you think the topics are uh, that will dominate? Well, we, we, we hope it's, it's, it's not going to be all digital, although I think we're going to be integrating some of our digital learning into uh, what we think, uh, we, we, we hope will be an in-person event back in Beijing. Um, uh, look, I, I, I think this event, the event this year, has really helped define who we are as a Bloomberg new economy institution and I think clarified the mission which is primarily to act as a you know place where leaders business leaders government leaders from around the world including from the east and west can can collaborate on common challenges um, I think beyond that uh, two things. Uh, first of all, we want to build out the Bloomberg New Economy uh, media platform uh, to illuminate the problems. And, and, and secondly, we've already started to do this. We've set up a small number of councils um, and we're deploying um, uh, the assets, the full assets uh, of Bloomberg editorial, our amazing journalism, our data, our research groups, um, looking into things like, you know, green energy, into macroeconomics, into technology, into cities, bringing those assets together with our members, our community, and turning them into sort of mini think tanks, surfacing leading ideas that could potentially inform policymakers as they try to figure out a operating system for this new economy. Well, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. There's no question. Two radically different systems, two very different sorts of ideas, and all of us knowing that if we don't come together to try to find some of the solutions, uh, the challenges are only going to grow uh, a lot greater. So uh, with that, Andy, a lot of fun working with you as always, and uh, great to have such a productive uh, afternoon and, uh, and week. Uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing each other a lot. But let me uh, hand the mic over to you and, uh, and let you close it out. Well, uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, hope to see you uh, in Beijing next year, uh, in November, we expect. Um, uh, to close, um, uh, we're going to listen to a piece of music uh, that was recorded by Yo-Yo Ma, especially for the new Economy Forum. Uh, it's a piece uh, uh, by, uh, written by uh, a song by Dvořák, and it is appropriately entitled going home. I'm Yo-Yo Ma, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about music and play for you. What I'd like to say to you, as you have spent several days thinking about what will become a new normal, I'd like to bring us back to the end of the 19th century when a Mrs. Thurber invited a wonderful composer from Bohemia, Dvorak, to come teach at the National Conservatory of Music. We all know Dvorak's music, but we don't know as much his influence as a teacher. He said to his students, listen to the music of Native Americans, listen to the music of immigrants, and from there you will find your voice. So we don't measure Dvorak just for the New World Symphony the American Quartet, all his other great works. But we also measure what happened in the future because of what he said. And what he said was he'd listened. I'm sure in the last few days, all of you did a lot of listening. And from the listening, to everybody around you, you can guide us through to the new economy 
the way that Dvorak helped guide American music into vast new worlds. Thank mm -hmm. you.